Hello, good evening everyone. Uh, we're going to get started, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, I don't think we have any changes that I'm aware of to the agenda. Um, we did have one thing, at least added on the sheet, added to the consent agenda, but I think that is reflected online. So, um, without objection, we're going to consider the agenda approved. No one has any thoughts on that? Okay. Um, so we're going to move on to general business and appearances. So this is an opportunity for um, anyone from the public to make comments on something that is not a part of our um, regular agenda for the evening. Um, and if you would, try to keep your comments to about two minutes. And that's going to be true for all of the public comments for tonight. I would like to request... Oh, you should probably state here. Thank you. I'd like to request that the piece about the declaration of official intent for parking garage be pulled from the consent agenda and dealt with later when you deal with the garage because of this concept called rebuttable presumption uh, that it infers that a deal is already done when it's not. We can pull that off. It's fine. Thank you. But uh, you don't need to wait. We can explain that quickly. Oh, we can. Okay, fair enough. Maybe we'll, we'll deal with that uh, through the consent agenda. But we can we can talk about it then. After. Sure. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Hi. Uh, I'm Hope Petrero, and I'm a junior at Montpelier High School. And I'm here to tell you all about the Race Against Racism, which I founded a year ago and is happening for it, the second time this year at Montpelier High School. The 5K walk and run will hopefully be through the city of Montpelier, and the rally will be at Montpelier High School. And it's a fundraiser, but also just a community event to bring people together in the fight for racial justice. And um, our beneficiaries are Migrant Justice and Youth for Change. And the rally will include speaking performances and lots of great food. And plenty of high school sports teams are running in the event as well. So I hope you all can make it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? And you want to explain this? Oh, yes. So Donna has this um, color, uh, color system. So uh, if, as you are talking, um, so we're, we're hoping to keep uh, people's comments to about two minutes. And so if you uh, have one minute left, you're going to see the orange card. And then if you are at two minutes, you're going to get the red card. So then you know to stop. So and I'll probably interrupt you at that point if that happens. All right. Um, thank you. Awesome. Right. So moving on to the consent agenda. Do we have a motion? I make a motion to approve. I'll second. With H pulled, right? Uh, sure. Well, do you want motion to, to approve with H pulled. Okay, great. And you're still okay with that, Donna? Yes. Great. Um, any further discussion on any of those items? Are you all in favor? I, oh, sorry. yes, Donna. Oh, um, sorry, Rosie. <laughs> I apologize for um, discussing one item when we normally don't discuss these. I did note that um, one of these is a street closure application um, with a noise variance that ends at midnight. Um, we did receive a constituent uh, comment. I think Donna and I received it. I'm not sure if everyone received it. Um, from some folks who live in that neighborhood who are a little bit concerned about Langdon Street being closed uh, and specifically uh, that the noise uh, ordinance would be waived for so late at night frequently. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, approve this in this instance, but I do want us to be a little bit more aware of being careful about um, downtown uh, waiving the, the noise ordinance um, so frequently and thinking about are there ways to keep it at 10 a.m., which I think is a little more reasonable. 10 p.m. 10 p.m., yep. yes. <laughs> um, so just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, let's talk about H. So item H is a, a statement of intent to bond. It doesn't bind you to anything. And the, the advantage of adopting that now is that um, obviously we don't know if we will bond A, if whether you actually put it on a ballot, and B, if it passes. But any if, it, if those things were to happen, if we should incur expenses 
design costs, those kind of things, then they become eligible for the bond if they're done in advance of the bond vote after this resolution as opposed to any only expenses after the bond. So it's a, it's a, it doesn't require you to bond. It doesn't require the voters to pass anything. It simply protects us for expenses. So I would recommend we do it. Donna. I'm sorry, Bill. Would you explain more how it protects us? I mean, it, it protects us in that we can start. I mean, we're not going to spend tons of money because we don't have the authority for money. But if we were to spend so-called soft costs, legal costs, or design costs, those kinds of things, in anticipation of you know preparing for a bond vote or putting together these things, then we can include those in the bond if we chose as part of the, the actual project cost. Uh, if we don't pass this resolution, then we can't. We just have to take them out of our general budget. We might choose to anyway, but it gives us that op option. It doesn't require that we float a bond for anything. Any further questions? So I'll make a motion okay, that we approve the non-binding declaration of official intent for the parking garage. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. All right. And so moving on. So we uh, recently uh, talked about creating a social and economic justice advisory committee. So we have some appointments to uh, that committee. Um, I think I saw some people who uh, have applied to that here. So uh, if any of you would like to come introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your interest in serving on the Social and Economic Justice Committee. Michael Sherman. Um, uh, let's see. I, I think probably others think that it was later on the agenda, which is why some Could of be. not here. <laughs> uh, anyway, I um, I submitted an application, so I assume you've read it, um, and I'll just say that um, uh, I guess the skills and the, the skills I bring are the skills of a historian. I, I've been a historian my whole professional life, except for stinted baking at the Mangies. Um, <laughs> Um, and I just think that those are valuable and important skills in, in a, a situation like this, where we have to gather information, assess it, evaluate it, um, and try to sort of use it in a way to go forward with, uh, with, with the goals that the committee is charged with. Um, I also want to say that, I've, as you saw in my resume, I, I spent a lot of time thinking, writing, and teaching about subjects either directly or indirectly related to this. And my feeling is that institutions reflect the values of the society that creates them. And I'd like to see what a committee like this can do to shore up those institutions, strengthen them, and correct the problems that we face. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Michael. Thanks. Beautiful. Anyone else yeah. here? Yeah. Can you hear me? Get closer. Get closer. I'm Sydney Collier. I am here. <coughs> you have to get right up on top of it. Just get a little closer. Close. There you go. Okay. Um, I'm Sydney Collier. I hope you all read my application. I'm an immigration attorney. Been focused on diversity my entire life. Um, advocate for it and really believe in the power of diversity to strengthen a community. I think that there has been a lot of polarization um, and in the country, and I want to try to prevent that both in the schools and in the community and bring people together. Um, wasn't really prepared to talk today, so I'm happy to answer questions, but I really look forward to hopefully serving on this committee. You have some great applicants, so whoever is on the committee, I think will do a fantastic job. Thank you. I didn't ask before, but any questions? No? Okay. Anyone else here from that pool? Okay. Uh, so we have five applicants for up to seven seats. I think we said one or two of them could be council members. Um, 
so one hypothesis is that we can, we maybe don't need to go into executive session, um, but that's just a hypothesis. <laughs> um, what, what would you all like to do? I would happily appoint all five of our applicants to this committee. So the only point that I will raise, um, and I, I propose this, and so one of the things that a few folks have asked about are um, special sort of, or seats reserved for particular groups across the state of Vermont, and I don't know that that needs to necessarily be discussed in executive session, but I really do want this to be the sort of committee that, that brings in those voices as well from organizations who are also engaged in the work. So I don't, I don't know what that looks like um, or if that requires like some fine tuning on the, on the council piece to reserve those spots or, but. So um, this is a committee that we've created, right? Great. So we can have as many people on it as we <laughs> want. Um, so. I mean, I guess my recommendation is we should uh, see, uh, actually maybe that crew can think through who's missing from the table and who they'd like to invite um, intentionally in, into that, that group. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I think that would work. Okay. I just, I, I would hope that it happens sooner rather than later. And I guess that also is a question about council members as well on the committee. So I don't know what that looks like either. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Connor, Connor then, then Donna, yeah. Well, I, I think we heard from somebody tonight who is young, interested in racial justice issues, and uh, very articulate. So I would like to ask Hope to consider applying for this committee. <laughs> would we take high um, school students the on commitment? committees? It's true. So just, just something to think about, Hope. Think about it. I will. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. Uh, Donna. Well, I think for sure, and it was one of my concerns, that we make sure that we bring in resources from all the various groups that exist. But their commitment to the committee might not be the same as our residents. And that we, we can take the five that have applied tonight and we can add hope and others as we, you know, entertain them or they entertain our attention. So I hope it stays open and fluid. <coughs> So I'd make a motion that we accept the five candidates that have applied to be the initial beginning of this committee of, of long name, uh, social, social justice, I don't have it in front of me. Social and economic justice advisory. Economic justice. Yep. Econo social and economic justice advisory committee. And that we appoint them for two years. Second. And appoint Hope as a student rep. <laughs> if Hope says yes, that would be great. I just need more information. <laughs> <laughs> I gladly would. I just need more info. Don't worry. There'll be time. <laughs> okay. I don't, think we we back to to I don't think we have to force her to no, do it no, tonight. No. <laughs> we'll keep you on our mailing list so you know about the meetings. All right. Great. So we've had a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? I'm sorry, I forgot we didn't, I didn't ask yeah, I just, further discussion. The only, I the, yeah, no, that's okay. Um, I, I certainly, I voted aye oh, okay, in great. favor of appointing <laughs> everyone. Um, I just, I want to, to really encourage the committee, which I'm, I don't know how we'll handle council appointments, but I really wanted to actually be a, a diverse group of folks as well, and the folks who have applied today are incredibly qualified. Um, and I, I just hope that there's some outreach that happens, and I'm certainly happy to participate and engage in that to, to make this an, a diverse body as well um, in terms of folks that we are trying, you know, in terms of things, issues that we're trying to address. I want to bring in people who are directly impacted by, you know, a not living wage and all of those things so I look forward to working with you um, and I I just it's really important to me that we bring in those voices to city committees like this um, I think we haven't yet uh, did we appoint you to the committee no. I think we should do that <laughs> <laughs> since, we're, since we're in that process uh, Connor I'll make a motion to approve Ashley Hill as uh, the council representative to this committee second okay any further discussion okay all in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. I didn't vote. I didn't think that would be appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> I could have voted awesome. no, I guess, or I could have declined, but 
All right, great. So, and I guess we'll leave it to e either you, Ashley, or Jamie to coordinate the sure. first meeting of that group. Oh, both of you. Perfect. Great. All right, the housing authority appointments. So here we have, I think, two people um, who have applied for one seat. So um, are either, I know Mary Alice Bisbee is here. I don't know Eric. Oh, great, great. Um, all right, so if, uh, if you'd both uh, be willing to come up and introduce yourselves and tell us about your interest in this uh, committee. That's very kind of you. I don't know about that. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, <laughs> my name is Eric Schulteis. I'm a staff attorney uh, with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate at Vermont Legal Aid. Um, so I'm interested in serving on this committee. Um, in the past, you know, I have a focus, a legal focus on housing, low-income subsidized housing, both in law school and then in my practice for three years in California. Um, I the subsequently I've uh, been engaged on a different side of the question from the housing authority's perspective from my work with the Cambridge Housing Authority. Um, and I think my real focus on social services generally and housing in particular is how to use data uh, to create a responsive system. Um, and a large part of that comes from a belief that social service agencies look at reporting requirements and evidence-based um, methods as a real burden and to try to envision how it could be an opportunity and it can be leveraged for their purpose to better serve their clients. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mary Alice Bisbee. I know most of you, and I hope you have read my application, which somehow got lost for a while, but I think it did get in at the last minute. Um, I uh, have none of the qualifications of the other applicant. I am not a lawyer. Um, I am uh, an expert at downward mobility, uh, having, lived, having had the lived experience of such. I live in subsidized housing I, I, under the Montpelier Housing Authority. Um, I have some ideas of how some of the buildings could be made more energy efficient and, and ideas about uh, housing for uh, young families. I know there are a lot of ideas, but if you want the lived experience, I have been a social worker in the past. Um, I have a deg master's degree in gerontology, human service administration. I do not have a very long work history because people don't like to hire people when they're old. And I was a long time um, homemaker back in the days. So thank you very much for considering me. And if you want somebody other than Jack McCullough to lead the group, um, I think you've got a good person in the other candidate. <laughs> Gosh, well, all right, thank you. Um, all right, so for this one, because we do have two applicants for one seat, we probably should go into executive session. So um, do we have a motion to that effect? I'll move that we go into executive session for the consideration of an appointment to the Housing Authority Committee. Second. Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, we will be right back. Yeah. Uh, I think we have to move to come out of executive session. So moved. Oh, is a good friend? Do you judge me not? Second. <laughs> uh, we're coming out of executive session. That's the motion. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. Uh, I move that we appoint Eric Schulteis to the Montpelier Housing Authority. Second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? OK. And thank you, Mary Alice, all, and, and to Eric. Um, and uh, we know that there's another seat that's going to be coming open soon. So I uh, hope to keep you involved somehow. All right, thank you. All right, moving on. All right, I get, we're just going to get set up here for a second. So. Oh, OK.
Sorry, I'm <laughs> getting myself together here. Uh, so the next item, um, which I suspect lots of people are here for, is the discussion on the parking garage. So we're going to need a couple minutes, I assume, to... I think we're actually in pretty good shape. Okay. Um, are you presenting this from down there, Bill? Yeah, because it, it doesn't reach okay. to my seat. So. I'm going to move over. <laughs> okay. Um, first, I'd like to uh, say that Stephanie Hanley from White & Burke is on the conference call phone with us. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, everybody. <laughs> So we can all hear Stephanie. I think she's going to watch um, on the live stream, so be able to follow along. You want to move your mic over, Bill? Sure. Uh, it's kind of taped down here. I get it as close as I can get it. Um, just get started. Oh, there we go. Stereo. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so, this is a discussion about the proposed parking garage. I did uh, send you all a memo and we posted it publicly last night. I wish we could have got it sooner, but some of the key terms weren't really uh, settled or proposed to be settled until yesterday. So, I apologize for that. I am not going to wade through all of the detail from the memo, but certainly happy to answer any questions. I uh, would like to hit the highlights. Um, with any project, it's, uh, I think the key thing is what are the project goals? So our economic development strategic plans specifically calls for two things as major uh, initiatives. One is new public parking and one is a new hotel, uh, as well as affordable housing. So three of the major goals of our plan are all addressed to some extent with this project. The other project goal was to keep timing moving forward so that um, we could have a bond vote in November that worked with the timing of the hotel project. So those have been the guiding principles. Um, this is the design of the area uh, with the smaller garage that was approved uh, through our design review process, not the larger one, but you get the general idea. The white building is the new hotel. Uh, behind it is the one Taylor development with the bike path, and then you can see the parking structure next to the new hotel. And behind the church is uh, a layout of where the proposed church housing would go, um, which is probably two or three years away, but has been accommodated in the project planning. So this is the, the big picture uh, sort of I look at this part of town and what uh, may happen with it. Uh, the project that we're specifically talking about is the city's role in the parking garage. It would be a 348-space parking garage. Uh, the garage plus the surface parking at Capitol Plaza will lead to 160 net new parking spaces uh, in the city um, versus what's on that, that area of ground now. Uh, a key emphasis for this is that there's no property tax increase uh, required. It's funded through the fees and permit costs for the garage as well as TIF revenue, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, the land is being donated by Capital Plaza. We do not have an appraisal on it. Um, probably the range of prices is somewhere between, or values, excuse me, is somewhere between $350,000 and $700,000. Um, the city will con construct, own, operate, and manage the facility. Uh, so that's key. So we'll own the land. We'll, we will have it all. So this is a drawing of the larger facility from behind. You can see it does uh, eke out into the uh, Heaney parking lot, 60 State Street, in order to get the uh, extra 150 spaces. Uh, the rest is the same as the design you saw from the front. Uh, again, this is conceptual. Uh, this is the external design is based on the design approved th for the smaller garage, except that it expands the green walls <laughs> further. Um, uh, around. So that is something that can still be considered. So some financial assumptions were made in running the numbers on this project. And again, we had great assistance from White and Burke and Stephanie Hanley uh, specifically, who are experts at this field. Uh, the assumption right now is the total project cost is $10 million. We feel like that is reasonable based on the uh, construction quotes that we have, other costs uh, that we've considered all rolled in. So as I said, that includes cost of construction, design, per, uh, obtaining permits, environmental work, et cetera. 
The assumption is that uh, obviously we're basing it on what we know about current bond rates. Uh, anything could happen between now and a vote and um, when bonds are actually inter issued uh, in this project, probably not until February or March at the earliest. So obviously that's a variable. The uh, pro forma is based on a 30-year bond with the first four years of interest only and then beginning to play, pay what we call declining principal, so your highest payment would be in year five and then declining thereafter. Uh, the assumption is that uh, CPI would be 2.25, so all expenses as well as uh, income has been adjusted by that throughout, um, the assumption being that they would all uh, be adjusted by whatever the real amount was, um, but that was the, the number used. We are only allowed to use TIF revenue for 20 years, so even though there's a 30-year bond, it only has TIF revenue for 20. Um, one of the interesting pieces is in the VEPSI model, the Vermont Economic Progress Council, which approves TIFs, they do not allow you to increase the TIF value in your, in your calculations, but you do in real life. So this pro forma has assumed that the, the value and the tax bill to the hotel will be, remain the same for 20 years, exactly, that we won't increase our tax rate that there won't be any value change, et cetera. Um, so that we use that same uh, conservative calculation in our assumptions. So obviously, one assumes that that will grow. We also have no other TIF increment. Now, for those familiar with TIF, it is that uh, within a certain district, any new property that's being developed, the value of the, the new addition can go into this tax increment financing fund. This assumes basically the increment only from the brand new hotel. It doesn't assume any other projects, any other increment from other things. So again, we're being conservative. Obviously, other revenues in that district could be used for this. We'd prefer to save those for other infrastructure projects uh, as necessary. But again, we sought to give it the most conservative look that we could. And we've built in um, what starts at 50000 and goes up by CPI, uh, capital reserve funds included annually, which will, of course, be put into a reserve fund to be used when uh, major maintenance and improvements and repairs are needed for the garage. So those are underlying financial assumptions. Bill, what was the amount per year that goes into that? Uh, 50000 at the first year and then going up by CPI. Okay. Um, so this is kind of everything all together. I'll try to um, break it all apart. This is a 20-year expense um, projection. Uh, Rosie correctly noted that we really should look at this 30. I just didn't do 30 because it didn't really fit on the page as well, but um, the, it does show up in a later uh, graph. Basically, the blue bars are the income. The red bars are the expenses. The gray uh, line that goes across the bottom is the annual um, plus or minus and the yellow line is the cumulative uh, balance. So with the, as you can see, the first four years have no uh, are interest only with the bonds so that um, it, revenue greatly exceeds expenses and that is basically stored up because the next five years um, as the highest payments of the bond hit uh, we use that reserve to, to stay in a positive cash mode for the entire project and you can see around 2030 it starts to even out and then slowly, uh, you know, at that point you're, you're looking way out but at that point the garage is really covering its own costs. Where does the money come from? Um, I'm going to break this down further but basically about 19% of it is the TIF revenue and again we assume that 148 uh, for all 20 years. This is I took the year 10 average just because of the all the dealing with the, the uh, bond. You know, how do you pick one typical year? So I said at the end of the first 10 years, this is the average projected revenue on an annual basis and the average projected expenses. And similarly with the income, um, the there is a the 103 is not labeled. That's operating costs. So that would be the cost of annual maintenance, cleaning. Uh, electricity, that sort of thing. The capital reserve is the the marked one, and then the debt service, of course, is far and away the largest uh, expense for the for the garage. So, uh, as you can see, that's uh, after ten years, we're averaging about seven hundred and thirty thousand, taking in on average about seven hundred and eighty thousand. So 
so here's the projected net income over 30 years, a, a five-year increment. So again, looking at um, the annual versus expenses. And these are the averages, not because, again, there's no one typical year. So you can see at five years, we're in great shape. Ten years, it's, uh, you know, now it's closer to the bone, as we discussed. And, oh, I don't know what just happened. Uh-oh. Shock the projector. Oh, uh, come on. Go on. All right. Wow. Uh, and then 15, and then you can see further out um, things. As the bond starts dropping off, um, there is a, um, as the bond starts dropping off, then, then the, the income starts showing stronger. So here's a, a third, full 30 year run um, where you can see the annual versus the cumulative. And again, once you get out beyond 20 years, you're, you know, it's pretty speculative. But the two arrows I pointed out, the first one in uh, 20, 24, that is the first year of the full bond payment. So that's where you can see the dip in the annual cash flow. When you get out to 2030, that's when it starts hitting positive again. And then another dip is in 2039 when the TIF revenue ends. And then after that, um, you can see. So forgetting the cumulative line, you can see in the out years, it shows pretty steady that it's, it's covering its costs. Where's the money coming from? Um, so as I mentioned, the Capital Plaza is donating the land. They will also be paying market rate permits, uh, permit fees. Uh, once we negotiated everything, looked at all the costs, uh, we, we settled on $125 per month. They will purchase 200 permits uh, and pay for those for a 30-year lease. Uh, again, their permits can increase by CPI. Uh, if necessary. Uh, so that's a pretty substantial commitment to this project. They will not necessarily use all 200 of them on a given day. Uh, conference days, wedding days might require the use of all of them, but they will be paying for them regardless of their use. That's not unlike people that have permits in our parking lots right now. You might buy a monthly permit in one of our parking lots and you take a week's vacation. You still have the permit, you just didn't use the parking spot and someone else is parking in your place and paying for it. Um, we expect to, we project to sell 80 other permits to other users at longer, you know, sort of more permanent type per users, probably not 30 years, but maybe five years type thing. Um, and those would be at the same rate. Um, we, our goal is to keep all the commercial users at comparable rates. Um, we will allocate, and our spreadsheet doesn't start this until year three or four because of that project, but we've uh, accommodated the possible need for 30 units for the affordable housing project at $50 a month, and that is factored in after year four. Um, so that was the change from the regular commercial rates. 38 open spaces, those are just unaccounted for. Even if all the permit holders are in, there would be 38 open spaces. $80 a month estimate is based on really what we see for daily rates and usages at our other parking lots. So that was how that was modeled. We did a lot of work, particularly those in downtown. We had to discount out things like Stonecutter's Way and other areas. But the core downtown lots, that's about what we get per space. I call that in red because one of the key aspects of the finances of this, and we should be clear about this, is what we call flex spaces. And so that's the space that's used basically twice or more. Uh, so Capital Plaza pays for permit. Their hotel guest comes in in the evening, stays overnight, leaves in the morning. Um, that leaves that space open for the day. And so someone in downtown Montpelier might park there for the day. Perhaps even someone working there might park there for the day. Um, Typically for these garages, as we've looked into them, 40 to 50% flex is considered the standard. We used 30 to be conservative um, until we had an uh, aspect of it. But uh, an astute resident looked at my memo and sent me an email at 7 o'clock this morning and said, you know, you've got 400 and some odd spaces in a 300 and some odd space garage. And so it was a good question, and I wanted to be sure to call that out, that, mm -hmm. that they don't add up. And we have to, um, so we are double counting spaces, and that is intentional. It's not uh, by accident. Additionally, the TIF revenue from the garage, which you've, we've explained, uh, again, being held constant. This is all based on first year pricing. So that's the, the breakdown of where revenue would come from the garage. The expenses, as I explained, are operating costs, capital reserve, and the debt. 
Additional benefits to this project in, in discussion with Capital Plaza, they are, they are creating um, around 60, I think the number is maybe, maybe as many as 68 parking spaces, uh, surface parking, and did not have a specific plan. So in discussion, we decided that we would continue, we currently lease about 50 spaces from them in their parking lot now. So the city would continue with lease using the same lease terms, uh, 50 plus or minus number to be finalized. Uh, surface places for public parking. So these would also be additional public parking, probably short-term parking um, that would be available in downtown in addition to the longer-term parking in the garage. So that is a nice addition to town. The design also calls for an ADA-compliant bike path connection and park area adjacent to the garage between the hotel that's accessible from the road. So it would be a really uh, great place for people to connect with the bike path, obviously for hotel guests, but also people who park in the garage and residents who wish to use it, a uh, place to rest from your bikes. Uh, the design even includes having some bike repair tools in there. And um, we, you know, perhaps we would talk to a local vendor about renting bicycles or something. So there's a lot of opportunity there. This is the site plan. It's very site plan -y. Um, <laughs> But what you can see, all the in blue is the surface parking. You can see that the road comes in off of Taylor. So the, the white at the top is the current Capitol Plaza. In the back is the new hotel. And again, the smaller garage. We don't have all the plans with the, the larger garage, but the layout is very similar. Um, so you can see there's a, a roadway coming in from Taylor, and then it makes a 90 degree turn left to go to State Street. That is also the direct access to the parking garage. So we would have, an, that would either become a city street or we would have a permanent right of easement and easement with um, the Capitol Plaza to make sure there's always public access to our garage. The rest are the surface parking areas that we would be leasing for public use. The plaza would review, reserve a few for some of their tenants who need reserve spaces uh, and otherwise, but the rest would be leased by the city. If you look at the lower portion, you can see the bike path. That is the easement the city's already purchased and where the bike path will be connecting. And then next to that, now I apologize, it's not that clear, but that is the area, that whole green area is where the bike path connection would be made uh, so that people can come in. And I think you go through the garage and come out and uh, have that connection there. Um, and there's also a pathway between the hotel and um, that. So access to the, uh, and I could be wrong about that, but there, anyway, there is direct access. So that is the site plan uh, currently. Concerns and risk. One of the questions we hear a lot is, you know, you're making, what is the, the garage going to look like? As I said, presently we're working with the garage design that was approved already through the design process. Doesn't mean it can't change. I mean, there are certain, we probably have a price point where our, our pro forma stops working, but certainly we'd welcome uh, input if people were interested in uh, looking at the design as long as we do it in a timely and cost uh, fashion. But we, we, you know, we certainly want to make it, is it going to be a major structure in downtown? The selection of contractors, I, I put this in the memo, I'm not going to go into detail, but we are, I am recommending that we move forward with DEW as our contract construction manager. Uh, they have, they are already our, our contractors for uh, One Taylor, they are the contractors for the hotel. Uh, their services for One Taylor were um, acquired through a federally mandated bid process and they've agreed to hold those terms. Uh, for us uh, on this project so that um, they were procured that way. I think given the logistics of working in the tight area and um, economies of scale with all these projects, I think we should move ahead with them uh, rather than taking the time to, to perhaps get a competing uh, contractor in there. One thing I will say about their, their process is they're construction managers, so they still bid out all the sub work and the contract calls for us to see all those bids and participate with them in selecting the individual concrete pourers and electrical contractors, those kind of things. What they're bidding is their fee on top of all of that, and which was very reasonable. Um, so, and similarly, the architect, uh, Rabidou Associates from Waterbury, they have designed the garage and the hotel to date and have the work and knowledge in, and it's, we are negotiating with them now um, about continuing that. It seems to make more sense than going out hiring a whole new architect and engineering firm to design something that's three quarters designed already. 
um, one of the things that's come up is reduced car use in the future. What happens if people don't use as many cars and we're building a garage? And of course, none of us know the future, um, but to the extent that there are cars at all, and there are some cars, um, we have the opportunity to shift cars from other places into the garage and use, um, so we can take on-street parking and make more parklets or flowers or public gathering places. We could take some of our surface parking, develop that into businesses or, or more green space. Um, so while reduced car use is certainly something we need to look for, unless we assume it's going to go away and it's entirely, we see this is the sort of the last place people would park. We would constantly put people in there so that there would be a use for it. The other concern, of course, if you can't secure the additional parking permit holders, um, we do have some interest from some major employers in the community that we've talked with. We obviously haven't finalized any deals with them, waiting to see whether we're going forward. Um, but I would say that we, our budget calls for 80 permits uh, to go in, and we already issue 51 permits in our parking garage lots around town now. So there's certainly a demand for close to the full amount, and given the level of interest we've had, we think we can get the 80 permits that we need. And the other risk is the flex spaces. We don't know how, you know, we, we've based the assumption conservatively. We think uh, it works based on what we know. Um, and one of the one of the interesting pieces of this is that if the, if the Capitol Plaza and the Hampton Inn are as successful as we all hope they would be, uh, they might be using their 200 spaces all the time, which would be great because that's the point of the, the project, but then those flex spaces wouldn't be as available. But that isn't what usually happens with hotels and conference business, and so we think we have a reasonable uh, projection here. Nonetheless, I want to call that out. Contingencies. Um, these are things that obviously we can't go forward without. Obviously, I mentioned earlier the current financial assumptions. If there were a giant spike in interest rates, we'd have to rethink things. If there were giant changes in costs, obviously we'd have to rethink things. Uh, but as it, as it lays out now, it works. VEPSI approval of the tech, TIF district. Next Thursday is our meeting with them, our final hearing. We don't have any reason to believe we won't be approved. But as you can see, $150,000 a year in TIF money is uh, critical to this project. So if our TIF district were not to be approved, then we would not be able to go forward with this project. Um, council approval of the project and going ahead and putting a, a bond vote on. If you don't say, let's go, and you don't vote to put a, vote on, uh, a bond vote on the ballot, then it's not going to happen. So that is a contingency. And then obviously, uh, even if you do support it and put it on the ballot, and it, it ha still has to pass the voters. Um, before it is uh, done. And of course, like anything, um, although the, the current plan has, is permitted, the, um, the new garage is not. So we would be needing to amend our existing permits because it's going on to a neighboring lot. We need to, to deal with that. So those are all uh, contingencies that could stop this from moving forward. Key next steps, uh, securing the contractors. I just described those. The third contractor is Desmond. Uh, they are pretty much a sole source people. They do the specialized parking uh, management systems. I didn't talk a lot about that, but we're proposing to use what's called a smart garage system. Uh, that is what tracks people in. It tell, knows how many spaces are in the garage, knows how many have been used out of a certain allotment, so how many Capital Plaza spaces are left versus how many general spaces are left, those types of things, how many other permit holders are in, and assign spaces and will indicate when the garage is full, uh, if there are, you know, it, it will know if someone's going to be using it later. Uh, it's a very sophisticated system. It's being used in St. Albans, uh, Brattleboro, and uh, Rutland perhaps, and uh, is, is currently the state of the art in Vermont. Securing the additional parking commitments that I just talked about, the, the other permit holders. Completing the design. Uh, we have, as I said, we have a design for a smaller garage, but we still have to complete a design for which construction bids and things can be obtained. We have permit applicants. I, I caught myself as doing this just as an aside, is that we're talking about permits as in terms of regulatory permits, but we're also talking about parking permits. So hopefully that's not confusing everybody, but we have regulatory permit applications to complete and a process to go through. And of course, um, public outreach and information of which this is the first major step. 
Opportunities for public participation include um, our meeting tonight. Uh, council meetings in September and October, we have to choose, the council has a window between October 27 and October 7 when they can warn a special election and choose what to put on the ballot. So there will certainly be one special meeting for that purpose. Uh, the council may choose to take this up at other meetings between now and then, but certainly people can participate. Once, if it is warned and we go forward, there will be a public information hearing in October only for articles that are on the, the September ballot. So it, right now we're talking about m as many as two bond votes and as many as two charter changes. Uh, the there November. may be less of either. November ballot. November, I'm sorry, right. The public hearing will be the end of October. Thank you, Rosie. Yes, the November ballot. Um, as I mentioned, this has to go through permitting, so the Design Review Committee and Development Review Board permit hearings that people can weigh in. We had good participation uh, on these hearings when the original hotel concept was going through. And we will be regularly updating the web, Facebook, Front Porch Forum, uh, Bridge, uh, et cetera, for public to get information. And certainly welcome for any other suggestions um, for public participation that would be helpful to people. Um, certainly willing to do a special work, you know, staff workshop or something for people that want to learn more um, and or influence the decision or process. So the schedule, uh, we have tonight's meeting. Uh, there is, the council will have to call a special meeting between those dates to decide on bond vote and any other special election vote. We must hold a public information meeting between the dates of October 27 and November 5 and then the bond vote on November 6th if this all goes forward. So that would be the sort of formal public council schedule. There's plenty on the to-do list um, for us, but I'm willing to take any questions or comments. Stephanie can take questions to uh, any of us. I think there's members of the Capitol Plaza that are here. And um, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. I'll leave this up in case anyone wants to refer to a slide. I guess I'll stay here then. Um, so the way I pictured this part going is I'd love to um, start with council questions, um, comments, thoughts, ideas from, from you all, and then open it up for uh, public comments and questions. John, um, John can we turn the lights on? Yeah, it's yeah. fine. It's, we can still sort of see it. All right, so uh, council, thoughts, questions? Oh, sure. I have many, Mayor Watson. <laughs> Want to go first? I, I would love to. So I, I'm a no on this, and I think I've been very loud about that for quite some while now. I don't think that the public was sort of brought into this process early enough on. I also followed back in 2014, um, and, and a little bit before that, the push to bring a second hotel to town, which was met with significant opposition from the Capitol Plaza, which I can appreciate and understand. They said that they didn't think there was enough business to sustain two hotels then uh, when 20, 2016 comes around, then um, you know, then then apparently a feasibility study was was done for a second hotel, uh, and a direct quote that was given to the media was, "And well, isn't it? And what? Isn't it better for me to have it than somebody else?" This I see is a project that is benefiting one entity in particular, and I realize that there is the argument for the public good uh, of parking, but I significantly question what kind of public good parking actually is. We have made a commitment as a city to work on reducing our carbon footprint, uh, and I think that this significantly increases it. Additionally, um, one thing that I'm really concerned about is the fact that raw sewer like overflows into our river. And we have approved, is my understanding, a request to bond to provide significant revenue for upgrades to a water recovery facility here in town. And we need to make those upgrades. I mean, those, those are infrastructure upgrades that we have to spend money on in order to be able to build housing and to sustain all of the things that we are trying to do here, which, and my math is a little rough, but I'm pretty sure that puts us at about $26.5 million if we were to bond both projects fully. Um, and I know that the, the water recovery plan is in two phases, so we may be able to bond separately for all of those. But 
my goal as a city council member is one, to include our community in our development. And this was a plan, I read about it in the paper, um, and admittedly I was new to the council, uh, and t to me it sounded like a done deal when the press release came out and there was this big ribbon cutting with Phil Scott there, um, and, and it seemed like it was a done deal, and then it sort of came to light that all of these other things needed to happen, and then that, oh, city council is gonna need to approve this plan. Um, and, and I have thoughtfully listened to arguments on both sides, uh, and I just, I cannot support a proposal that didn't include community input up front. I appreciate that now that the proposal is put out there with sort of a very defined um, place and defined parameters, uh, that, that now the public is being asked for comment, but to me that was a, a fundamental misstep, and, and the public should have been brought in on this procedure far, far sooner than they were, um, and I, I just I cannot sit here as a council member and say that I support developing between 300 and 350 new spaces when we are trying to reduce reliance on fossil fuels and are trying to find alternatives uh, uh, to, to carbon. Thank you. I have lots of thoughts on that, but I'm... Okay, can I just offer yeah, one? Sure. Quick, I, I don't want to rebut Council Member Hill. I appreciate her opinion. I just want to be clear. One thing we have not um, committed to bonding for de the wastewater plant yet. That's on the next meeting, and we don't, th that may or may not be going forward. Secondly, um, just technically, it would not be the same money. So whether we, this is coming from parking revenue and TIF revenue, none of which would be eligible to be used for the wastewater plant. So that. But the city's on the hook either way. That's so, correct. But so it, it yeah. could. But I just essence. want to be clear that, that sure. we're not taking money from one to to pay for the other. But That's we all. are asking, and I just want to make sure I'm clear on this then, but we are in essence asking taxpayers to assume the risk that, that if we are unable to generate sufficient revenue to That's cover correct. those payments, and, and I, that would be, I would be derelicting my fiduciary obligation to this city to support both projects, and to me, infrastructure like a water recovery facility is far more critical than, than this particular plan. Thank you. Other thoughts? <laughs> Donna? So we disagree. We do, it's that's fine. okay. <laughs> and it's where the most and, growth and comes I, from. I guess for me, <laughs> uh, I remember when Tom was sitting over there, Tom Golanka, and he had to uh, recluse himself because we were discussing Capitol Plaza here in public two or more years ago. So I don't feel that I have at least I have felt the discussion has been there, it's been open, and what you read in the paper is in the paper. Uh, I guess I take more meat into what happens here. And I'm sorry that you feel like we've snuck it up on the public, because that's not our intention, nor is how I feel it's been revealed. And particularly then within the TIF, again, we talked about it in detail, and we had some estimates of cost. And I do feel like the vision for me is coming back to the Main Street scoping study, the Green of America capitals, the complete streets, and that if I want to see less pavement, then I got to get parked cars off the street. If I want to have more bikes, more pedestrian room, and more trees, uh, then I feel the vision is really important to get the parking cars collected. I'm not a parking garage fan, but I'm really a fan of getting them off the streets. <laughs> and I and agree with so, you there. Yeah. So to me, this is why I support this project. And I, and I do feel like the staff has been very conservative in revenue, and it is a risk. You're absolutely right. Uh, the weight, wastewater treatment recovery, that's going in a huge different direction of trying to use our waste to create energy. And whether that goes forward or not, I see that in a different pot and venue. So it's just a different perspective. That's so, all. No, and I want to be clear that I, I agree that we need to to sort of put parking in a place. I just, I, I no, question I whether did. or not yeah. this is the place. And I, I do have a quick follow-up question. Sure, but, I, uh, before yes. you go, is there any other thoughts? Um, I'll yeah. speak at some point, yeah. but I can go after Ashley. I'm not... I, I just have a question. Sure. How far from the river would would the closest point be of this new structure? I'd have to go back. Can we find that? There's... Um, it's, it's toward the beginning. It's uh, the one that shows the rear view. Again, it's conceptual. Um, so I, I'll, I'll answer it that way. <laughs> Keep going. No, Four? not that one. It's, it's a drawing. 
It's like a 3D. Yeah. Keep going. So it's near the beginning. It is, yeah, it is Sorry, near the guys. beginning. Sorry, guys. That one? That one, yep. Sorry, guys. Back. So this is the, this is the, the Keeney parking lot, mm -hmm. the 60 parking, so we can't really, so North Branch comes down this way, um, the rivers meet down here. This is one tailor over here. So like, I can't tell you the number of feet, but that's the perspective. This is the Christ Church. Wasn't there another picture that showed the river also? Yeah, um, that's true. Well, it would be the, the site plan, but that was with the smaller garage. This is the only drawing we have with, with the, the big perspective garage. Okay. larger garage. And this is Act 250 exempt because it's in a designated downtown area? I don't know the answer to you that. want to speak in your mic? So I apologize. I, I asked if this was Act 250 exempt because it's in a designated downtown area. I, I thought that I would believe be. that's the case, but I don't know for sure. So have we done any impact studies about what creating this much change to that area means in terms of like environmental impact? We have to do all of that for our own local permitting, and we have to do, you know, a lot of that was done for the initial proposal. Remember, the... the the, the 200 unit garage and, and all of these other, well, everything except for the Christchurch housing has already been through permitting, one tailor and all this kind of thing. So they've all taken that into account. So we would simply be updating information for going to the larger structure and finding, you know, again, that's a, a concept, finding the exact best dimension, you know, locations for it. But we have, you know, you have to do that. It's obviously, we would want to. It's in the city's best interest. Um, Glenn. Um, uh, it's uncomfortable for me to be at all in favor of building a parking garage. That's not something that I uh, ever thought that I would be in favor of. And I'm unsettled uh, in my support, but I am uh, in balance on, on Donna's side of this. Um, my sense is that uh, while I would love for there to be enormously fewer cars in, in the city to the point where we would not need any parking or, or m completely minimal. I don't see that happening uh, in the near future. And uh, one potential uh, good future would include a lot of electric cars, which will st still need to be parked. Um, I also uh, hear the argument that Ashley made about uh, the timing of this and the uh, the perception about Capitol Plaza as uh, the initiator in some ways. At the same time, I think that this is uh, an opportunity that we have uh, to solve a problem that has been a problem for the city for a long time uh, and do it in partnership with two entities, Capitol Plaza and the state through the, the TIF. Uh, that may not, th that opportunity, that kind of opportunity may not arise again uh, in the near future. It's certainly, uh, I hear all the risks and I, again, I'm not thrilled to be uh, in favor of a parking garage, but I am at this point. So I'm going to interrupt our process because um, I think one of the things that might be useful now is if there's any questions from counselors at this point and then let's go to um, the public for comments and then we can make sort of any other like further statements that we want to make after that. Does that sound okay, team? Yes. yes. So any further questions from counselors? Yeah. So these are things that I think I'd heard from you earlier, Bill, but I didn't hear them tonight and I couldn't remember and I okay. thought they'd be helpful. Um, what's our projected lifetime of the garage, assuming that there's still need for it? Like how long do we think a concrete parking garage lasts without needing major? I believe 40 years. Okay. Um, and, you know, with the understanding that our parking situation and car situation may look very different in 40 years, but that's a, a good thing to hold in our heads. Um, and then we... We'll, we'll build it structurally so we can handle the hovercraft. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had talked at one point about what our contingencies were in the case that construction costs were very different than they are right now, um, given where we are with tariffs and steel prices and all kinds of construction prices going all over the place, um, I, you know, I, I think it would be helpful for folks to know what our um, back out options are should we go out to, should our 
contractor go out to bid and find things are just the numbers are totally different than we thought they Correct. would be. Correct. Stephanie, do you want to try to answer that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess the question is, are you concerned about the construction pricing? Well, let's just say we're, we have to get those construction numbers firmed up at the time of entering construction. And at that time, they will bid the, bid the project. You know, we're talking within the next three to five months and to, to bid all of that work out. So we built in a couple of different contingencies. The contractor built in a contingency, and we added a contingency. So I think we're okay in that respect. Um, and I think we'll just we will know a lot more before we actually take out the debt. So our our ultimate, you know, back out option is that we just decide not to bond for right. this. Um, even if we have approval to bond, we can decide not right. to take out the bond if we decide that this is just not going to don't have enough money, right. The other, um, the other avenue, and I, I, I'm looking at Capitol Plaza people, but you know, uh, and we've, we've talked openly about this, they're, they're facing the same situation with their hotel. They're, they're working on projected costs and they're, you know, they're going to have to make <coughs> some key financial decisions that putting themselves on the hook for uh, I think 16 or 17 million dollars. And um, so, you know, we're in it together in, in that regard, but we can also look at the parking rates. If, if we need to adjust, uh, I mean, you know, as long as we're, if that's what happens, you know, that's another source of funding to help help make the project work. So, I mean, that is another contingency, but right at the end of the day, if it becomes, you know, if it becomes 12 million instead of 10 million, then it's, the, the parking rates aren't gonna work, the bond isn't gonna work, and I would suspect the hotel's not gonna work, so it doesn't happen. And what's our contingency should the hotel decide that their project doesn't work? I mean, I assume that they kind of move forward together, but there's, we don't, the TIF doesn't happen if the hotel doesn't happen. So we've That's correct. Kind of and obviously we, we would have a, a development agreement with them and, and the contractor, you know, isn't going to start our project unless they've got to go ahead to start their project. Okay. Another advantage of using the same contract. Ashley? And maybe I misunderstood what Stephanie said, but uh, Stephanie, did I hear you say that we would need to go forward with putting together bids and getting contractors lined up in the next three to five months? Well, from now, we're talking about three months, I guess, until the bond, until the, the vote happens. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying over the course of the next few months, we're not going to be able to get the bid in until we get the actual Oh, we'll be prepping all of that, but we have to kind of wait for that November vote, so. Right. Okay. So, so in theory, right. then, none of that, nothing, well, obviously nothing could happen before then, but it, I guess I, my sort of question is, is that the best use of city resources in that time when there are lots of other projects that are also ongoing, and I know that city staff is already sort of at capacity, and I just, it's, it's, it's just another thing I think that we should be aware of that it's going to take significant resources to, to do those things. Okay. Any other further questions from, oh, yes, Jack. Um, I had communications from a couple of constituents uh, sort of along the lines of what Ashley was saying, not exactly saying, well, what's the rush? Why should the city be doing this kind of thing on the timetable of the developer? And so I'm just curious about what... Uh, what uh, negative consequence could flow from saying, well, we're just going to slow down and, uh, and not proceed at this time because people have not had, uh, had time to digest this? I think, um, uh, you know, I, I, I can, Capital Plaza folks can answer for themselves. I understand they've got, you know, a contractual obligation to begin work uh, in November, December, something like that, uh, or they lose their franchise agreement. Um, obviously, they're not going to start unless they have some assurance that a parking garage is coming in. Uh, while that's true, this is being driven somewhat by that that uh, schedule, it's also the opportunity. I know to answer the question earlier, um, you know, a private developer came forward with a project that met several community priorities that had been previously identified, and it was an opportunity to 
address a bunch of needs at once, and sometimes when you're doing economic development projects, you have to move them when, when the opportunity presents itself. And, and then I think from a, a, just a logistics standpoint, even if, even if the financing were all figured out, you know, building the garage and then coming, I mean, the hotel and then sort of coming in later with an open functioning hotel and building a new garage next to it with guests there and all that and, and, you know, wedging into that back corner behind, it just doesn't, you know, I think it just makes a lot more sense to build them sequentially and, and at the same time. So um, I think there's there's that argument, you know. But, there, you know, there's no question. I mean, we, we wouldn't be taking this on despite all the talk about the, the parking, but the, the TIF and an anchor tenant makes it possible. I mean, let's not forget, you know, I, it's something like $300,000 a year in permit fees that the Capital Plaza is paying for parking rights in there, um, as well as donating the property and the TIF revenue. So that's another 150000 So, you know, directly or indirectly, they're contributing $550,000 a year to um, the success of this project. So that's what makes this possible, that, to address a, a larger community need. Thanks. Uh, Donna. Did, I thought the hotel also made our TIF application stronger. Yes. They're looking for projects mm -hmm. that are real. Um, so to me, the TIF timing is also really a key element. OK. Further questions? Okay, so we want to open it up to the public. Um, so again, if you would try to keep your comments to two minutes, and Donna's going to help us there to keep track of time. Um, so if you have anything you'd like to say about this, now's the time. I don't know if I can keep it to two minutes, but I will do my best. Well, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Stephen Whitaker, Montpelier. Uh, from a planning perspective, it's fundamentally wrong to be having this garage location driven by one beneficiary. Uh, the phrase uh, privatize the profits and socialize the costs comes to mind. Uh, the planning process of how soon, how open a process we had to decide where a parking garage should go is fundamentally deficient. This should not be driven. And I note the irony of you also talking about a confluence park waterway on the same night, on the same agenda. And this runs, this project, if approved going forward, would hogtie the full purpose of the Confluence Park. I mean, I quote from the document linked in the agenda for the later item on the agenda. The, the river is now seen as a positive attraction where clean water and attractive riverbank is an essential element of the quality of life and future economy. And to a strong desire to transform the character of the riverfront from the edge of a parking lot to gracious riverside promenade. Here you are threatening to put a four-story albatross of concrete abutting. Who's going to want to go and snake their way around behind this parking garage to go to our our park? It, it, park it, it's contradictory. It, it's cap. fundamentally contradictory to the options that should be available to your waterfront park. Uh, there are. There is a need for parking. The logical place to put parking is in the pit from the pavilion all the way to the sheriff's office. That will take some logistics to organize among the federal building and Vermont Mutual. But that is the only sound place for a project of this scale. If you go to these other towns, I've done, I have in other states and in Brattleboro, these are 100,000 is grossly insufficient for maintenance. These garages become urinals and 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 collect uh, carbon you know they need steam cleaning regularly this is not this is not well thought out and it's being driven by one private interest and with inadequate planning by the city council I would ask you to think about your legacy as counselors to have this on your conscience and on your reputation Thank you, Stephen. I have two comments, just informational comments. One, the maintenance costs were taken from other garages. Um, that are poorly maintained. 
Well, that's a matter of opinion. Secondly, we did do several studies for parking garage locations over many, many years. Uh, parking garage locations have been looked at uh, for infinitum and the actual um, for one Taylor and the Capital District Plan, um, the two most prime locations are identified. One was this location. The other was um, actually behind here at the Jacobs parking lot. And I remember having a in fact, I see Nancy Sherman here. We had many discussions over which one of those was preferable. But this, this was identified through a pretty extensive planning process as one of the prime parking garage locations in the city. Thank you. Uh, Paul. Hi, I'm Paul Carnahan. I live on Sabin Street. Um, First, a, uh, a comment and then a question. Um, the comment is that um, I agree with uh, Councillor Hill's um, summarization of the process. Um, there was not the, um, or there was the impression that the hotel and the garage, as approved, were a done deal and everyone was happy and it was going to happen. So, if it had been thought that this was a, um, a city project for a garage all along. Uh, someone should have come forward and said, hey, wait a minute, this is a city project, not a, not a private project. So I think the process has, uh, has been flawed. Um, my question regards something that hasn't been brought up yet, which is traffic. Um, I assume there was some sort of uh, traffic study done for the smaller garage. Um, I don't know if those are just automatically updated. Um, but I was also just from a layman's uh, perspective, I was wondering what the traffic flow was that's being proposed, if it's a one-way traffic flow going in one side and out the other, or if it's going to be two-way, um, and what sort of um, what sort of traffic control devices you're looking at at those two major streets, because we are now putting a lot more cars in one place than had been originally proposed. So to answer your second question, um, we will have to, there was a traffic study done for the smaller garage and it will have to be updated with the new information. Um, that's correct. Uh, the current thought is it would be two-way, but that will be looked at to see if that makes sense. Uh, the other key issue, and I'm, I'm now, um, uh, Tom McArdle's going to come up and smack me here because I'm going to misstate, but he gave me a quick primer this afternoon um, that the key issue is that the timing of when people come and go, so it's not like 350 spaces, cars are all going to be leaving at the same time. You've got hotel guests that check in and leave at different times than workers and residents and those kind of things. So that's one of the, uh, there, there's a science to estimating that. So that will all have to be looked at. Uh, and I am not qualified to give you that answer, but that will be part of the permit process is amending, uh, amending this. I think just to answer the, the criticism, which is a fair, I think, is, um, the garage was initially proposed as a private garage, and that is what went through permitting, but I also will say that I believe it was said pretty early on that it needs to happen with TIF, and that it should, you know, really for it to be successful, it's going to have to be larger. And I know that the council's had several conversations about that since spring, and I think sometime this summer I tried to write an article for the bridge sort of laying out what we were talking about so people knew this was coming. So I, if people feel like we weren't open enough, I guess it's, it's, you can always be more open but I know certainly the, ex the intent was to communicate that as clearly as possible. I also want to call Paul out for being the, the sharp-eyed citizen that emailed me at 7 o'clock this morning about the... <laughs> I appreciate it. That was a great question. I will be, so thank you. Any further questions, comments from the public? <clears throat> John Snell. Uh, first off, I want to thank Bill for the hard work that you put in clearly uh, on this, uh, moving this along. And I, for one, don't feel blindsided. Uh, it, you know, the changes have been a, a bit uh, abrupt at times, but uh, understandable. I also want to thank the Bashara family for working hard on this. I uh, was a tenant of theirs for years, and I know that they're in it to make money, and they're part of the community and they couldn't be making money unless they were part of the community. This is a significant piece of infrastructure. It will require maintenance. I'm concerned about whether we can add another thing to the city that needs to be maintained. And I guess uh, we've woken up about other uh, aspects of the infrastructure. And I just hope that this one's on the radar so that it is maintained, because it would be a disaster if it weren't. 
Uh, I'm not too concerned about traffic management for the same reason, Bill, you just uh, uh, mentioned. I am concerned that there, that much of the uh, traffic, much of the parking will be warehouse, basically warehoused cars, and I had always hoped that that says nothing. You have one minute. Okay. <laughs> uh, I had always hoped that we could warehouse cars outside of town, but quite honestly, that's the same sort of a problem, just pushed outside of town. Um, so we are going to warehouse some cars there. Um, I am thrilled at the possibility of freeing up street parking and replace putting it in this damn parking garage. I can imagine that uh, at part of the Confluence Park, for instance, that we get to grab those 30-some parking places that are associated with Taylor Street, put them in the parking garage, and actually have a decent-sized park there. Two quick things. One is uh, I'd like the, uh, to investigate the possibility of going up one more floor versus wider and also to go flat versus angled so that in 40 years we potentially have a building that could be renovated into housing. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yes. Dan Groberg, Executive Director of Montpelier Live. Uh, Montpelier Live and the Montpelier Business Association strongly support this parking garage and encourage the council to move forward with this project. Um, it serves several community needs that have been identified over the course of many decades, um, and we have a unique opportunity here. Um, we have an opportunity to provide convenient parking for visitors to Montpelier while uh, enabling creativity with existing parking spaces, um, including the possibility of developing uh, other surface parking um, into new productive uh, buildings. Um, I think uh, while I would love to envision a possibility where there are zero cars in Montpelier, uh, I think that's an unrealistic vision. Um, and the, I think there will always be at least 350 cars coming into downtown Montpelier. And if we could eliminate all the other parking in Montpelier and only have 350 cars, that would be um, an amazing vision. <laughs> um, I think. Uh, this enables uh, a hotel project that is going to bring 30,000 meals a year to downtown Montpelier. Um, the economic impact to downtown is significant um, in enabling this new hotel project. It's going to enable affordable housing. It's going to enable possibly future development in the area. Um, and uh, it's, it's just a tremendous, it will be a tremendous asset for, for downtown. Um, we've been trying to increase tourism um, in terms of the carbon impact. Uh, we all know the impact of people driving around in circles trying to find a parking spot. So if there's a convenient garage that's well labeled and well marked, people will go to it um, with our new wayfinding that we'll have, I promise. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's a really great opportunity to, to lay out a, a future for the economic development of this city. Um, and I strongly encourage, and the Montpelier Live and the Business Association strongly encourage you to move forward with this project. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Hi, I'm Eve Jacobs Carnahan, um, and I live in Montpelier. So closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Closer. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Eve Jacobs Carnahan. Um, I definitely understand that, and have been around for many, many years and seen the city talk about the need to solve par parking problems. Um, there can be disagreement about what the extent of those problems are. But what I'm concerned about is that this appears to be um, a situation where a project has been put forward by a private developer and everybody is saying, oh, that's it, that's the solution. Instead of an analysis and a, an examination of is this the best solution, is this the best way to put forward, put at risk $10 million of taxpayer bond, bond money. And I don't, I'm not hearing an analysis of 
um, who this parking garage is for. Like, is it for commuters? Is it for shoppers? Is it for tourists? And the answer to those questions might suggest that you have a different type of parking garage or you have it in a different location. Because if it's for state workers who are commuting, maybe it shouldn't be in this location. Maybe it should be more on the periphery like many of the plans have been put forward, um, such as the winning bridges proposal for net zero. And then the other thing is, um, we're talking, so it's that, I'm understanding from the presentation and from just reading the one memo last night and seeing the newspaper is that the net gain to the city for public parking is 160 spaces. So I think we're talking about spending $10 million to get 160 spaces. And is that the right way to look at this? Maybe we should be spending $10 million to get um, 400 spaces none of which would be for a private hotel, but all of which would be for the broader city interests, or if the real goal is to do this to help state workers, then it should be a project with the state and put the money in that place and um, put it in a different location and fund it and get more parking spaces out of it. So I just don't see that there's a clear analysis going on. It seems as if people are seeing a possible project come forward that is frankly put forward it's here now because of a private hotel wanting to do it, and everybody's saying, oh, I think that's going to be the solution without an analysis, and that's what I'm concerned about. Thank you, Eve. Hi, Deb Sachs. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's dry in here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Net Zero Vermont, Executive Director of Net Zero Vermont, and we commissioned uh, the design competition that uh, gave the city a vision, and hundreds, almost a thousand people voted for that vision, and it didn't include, as I recall, a parking garage. If we want to get to net zero energy, a parking garage, an investment in such infrastructure would be leaning into more of car-centric and enabling car-centric lifestyles. And while I appreciate what retail needs and what your community needs, there are, what Eve just said, I fully support, is a, a broader look at this. And I know that you're doing and working very hard, and I just applaud your commitment to how hard you are working on this project for a parking garage. But illuminate and step out for a moment and look at what the options could be and what you could have moving forward um, 40, 50 years from now as we try to get to net zero, which is net zero energy, the amount of energy that we use is the amount of energy we're producing, uh, and, and having that renewable energy and electrifying our future transportation system could easily be met with a solution of a train. Imagine a community rail that's connecting the cities together in Vermont and that's met with good public transit and micro transit options. And that, that is where we might look at that broader analysis and see where this city could actually go and what it could be and how proud it could be of what it has. I have 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> um, so Net Zero would like to help on that and help get behind that kind of thinking and bring whatever resources that we can and experiences that other communities have. If the bond vote doesn't go forward, what is the backup plan? And how can we set the city going forward with maybe those auto capture lots that are out of town and thinking about what you're parking. And I know that you've studied this and studied this and studied this and over the years. And it's, it's, really, it's really hard, but um, working together, we can get there. Thank you. All right, any further comments from the public? Okay. Oh, oops. Oh, oh okay, all right. <laughs> So my name is Laura Gephardt, I'm with the Montpelier Development Corporation. Um, so many of the points that Dan raised from Montpelier Live, um, I totally agree with. Um, and all the comments that came out today, um, I, do, I do just want to address that 
the project was proposed by, by a private interest, um, and that is the nature of a public-private partnership on projects like these. Um, and the garage is meeting a whole lot of needs. A new hotel, which was identified in the Economic Development Strategic Plan as a transformational project, which is huge for the city. Um, there is a private interest, but it means it's bringing more people to the downtown to shop at our small businesses, to see the great city, um, to interact with the folks who live here. And it also provides extra parking for residents, people coming in to work. Um, so it has a lot of additional amenities, not just that private interest. But it wouldn't happen without that private interest who is also providing employment opportunities and is a very meaningful part of this community. Um, so I do just want to recognize that. Um, and in ter addressing some of the concerns about making it a car-centric uh, or you know, promoting this car-centric mentality, this isn't excluding future visions of you know, more sustainable uh, transportation options. This is just meeting a need. We're not, we still have cars and we will for a few more years at least. Um, so this is accommodating some of those uses and it does free up some surface lots for potential redevelopment for a higher and better use. Um, so just wanted to make those comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, any further comments from the public? Okay, so other comments from counselors. I'm going to go Connor, and then we'll go from there. So I, I'm not in love with building a parking garage. I, I don't think anybody is. You know, it's a, it's monstrous. It's uh, you, you know, it, uh, it it doesn't check a lot of boxes for me. That said, um, I do think the city did its due diligence in this case. Um, and I believe we need this capacity to accomplish many of the things we want to do for the future of this city. Um, one point I would address is, I'm a labor guy, um, a project of this magnitude is pretty rare for us in Montpelier, and I want us to be a socially responsible city and do it the right way. Um, so I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time to raise it, but I, I would bring up the idea of entering into a project labor agreement in this case, uh, which is a pre-hire collective bargaining agreement that sets the terms and conditions of employment. Um, that would determine the wage rates, the benefits of the employees actually working on the garage here. So I think there's more time to talk about in the future, but you know, we should treat these employees like we, these contractors, like we treat our own employees in city government. So I, I will be bringing that up in the future. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, before you. That's you totally go. fine. There's. Are you go? I will, but okay. you. Can Ashley, do you want to go? Um, go so I, I echo what Connor said. That's, I mean, it, it seems like there is enough yay votes to approve this, um, which is what it is. Um, but I, I certainly think that that's a significant piece. I know one of the issues that the uh, Social and Economic Justice Committee was going to ex explore was creating a city uh, minimum wage, uh, and then with particular regard to contracts potentially over a certain dollar amount uh, that we ensure that workers are treated fairly in those situations. Um, I would also raise the question, because the city is investing in this, and, and again, I, I don't know what this would look like. I'm not purporting to say that I would, um, but uh, the hotel will create jobs for the city, and one of the things that we as a city look at continually is what kind of jobs are these entities bringing to our community, uh, and I think that warrants consideration if the city is going to be spending $10 million um, or $10.5 million of, of city money. Uh, finally, I just, I, I am struck between uh, some of the the interesting contrast between talking about parklets and using um, parking for public good versus creating uh, a, a public good that creates a, a sort of direct private benefit. Um, and I understand that, that this is probably going to, to go to the ballot. It, it seems as though there is enough support, um, and I appreciate that. But it just strikes me that as a, as a member of our community who lives relatively close to the downtown area, I want my downtown to be accessible. And frankly, I would rather have parklets than parking garages filling our city space. And that's not to say we don't need parking, because we do need parking. But it, it's just an interesting juxtaposition that I felt like I needed to highlight uh, for everyone. Um, when we first had our uh, presentation from the uh, from the consultants for the TIF proposal, one of the things, that, one of the paramount points they mentioned was that 
we should not be proceeding on the basis of if you build it, they will come. That we should only use TIF fundings for uh, known projects with uh, with development partners, and uh, <clears throat> because otherwise we're uh, heading down the road to financial disaster. And I think that uh, this project clearly meets that. Uh, standard because we have a, a development partner in the hotel that is uh, going hand in hand with this parking garage. If the hotel doesn't go forward, the parking garage doesn't go forward and vice versa. I think the hotel will uh, increase uh, a lot of downtown activity and business and will provide jobs for people downtown, which are all things that we one, I think the uh, Bashara family over many decades, and I think back to what they did in 1992, has shown a real commitment to uh, improving uh, the city of Montpelier. Um, two or three meetings ago, we had a presentation from uh, the com on the Complete Streets project, and one of the things that's attractive to this is that if we have, uh, if it turns out that do we have less vehicular traffic than we do now, or less need for parking than we do now, we can move that parking off the streets, move closer to the uh, Complete Streets model that we uh, that we had presented to us, increase. Uh, Parklets and other public uses for the uh, for the space on the roads, and I think that's that's all a good thing. And finally, whether you agree with the complaints or not, one of the biggest complaints everybody has about Montpelier is that there's not enough parking. And the other thing we know from discussion of parking over many decades is that uh, whenever there is a proposal for a parking garage, for somehow it always seems to be the worst possible place for a parking garage. And I think that wherever a parking garage is proposed, it will get, uh, get opposition. Um, I think uh, one of the things we talk about in density and uh, avoiding sprawl is to build up and not out. Parking garage enables us to do that. Um, Steve, I take your point about maybe be, uh, the pit would be a good place for a parking garage rather than where it is now. If we build this parking garage here, maybe we don't need the pit to be just a big parking lot. Maybe that opens that up for other uh, other development which I would which I would like to see so I'm, I'm supporting this at this point yeah go ahead Rosie um, so I'm really sympathetic to a lot of the points that Councillor Hill made um, and there are points that I initially held myself um, when this came out initially as a, a private plan to do a, a development um, you know I kind of said well it's a it's a private piece of land and the developer within our parameters, within our zoning parameters, they can they can do what they want. Um, but in, you know, unless they're asking for the city's help, uh, you know, we probably shouldn't get too involved in it. Um, and then I felt really kind of I felt bait and switched when the uh, the Bashara family came out after having announced this is a done deal and um, and asked for the, the city's help and said that it couldn't move forward without the city's help. And I, you know, I was honest um, with them and with the rest of the council at that point. I, I was really mad. Um, <laughs> and I really pushed city staff to push really hard on this. If we are going to be involved, we need to get a good deal for the citizens of Montpelier. Um, and we need to get everything we possibly can out of this deal. Um, and so city staff have pushed. Um, and I'm really pleased with some of the concessions we've been able to get and some of the benefits we've been able to get for the public. Um, I still had a lot of concerns. You know, is this, this kind of fell in our laps? Is this, have we done our due diligence here? Um, and I've asked a lot of questions over the past I can't even, it feels like at least a year that we've, we've been talking about this, perhaps more. I, 
<laughs> something like that. Um, and uh, um, I think that the project is better for those questions. But I'm also really sympathetic to the, the notion that those a lot of those conversations have happened in executive session because we were negotiating. Um, so I would like to give the public the opportunity to feel like they fully understand this. Um, and to ask more questions, because I know that I've asked questions that have made this project better, and the rest of the counselors have as well. And even tonight, you know, I, I appreciated John Snell's comment about the, the flat garage being able to be um, repurposed at some point in the future. And, you know, s questions like that or, or other questions that haven't come up yet um, could make this project even better. Um, and so I asked Bill, you know, is there this is the night we're kind of giving the, the presentation of the proposed deal to the public. Um, but what are the points at which we can take more public input um, and ask, have the public ask more of those questions and bring more of those points to the discussion? Um, so it sounds like you know we need to, uh, if, if we want to uh, go forward with a bond vote in November, there is a timeline. But we don't necessarily have to commit to anything tonight. We could give some um, more time for folks to digest this over the next few weeks and um, take some more public comment at the next meeting before voting on, on September 12th. So that is an option. Um, and again, you know, the public does, we have to make a case for the public to support this in, in November. Um, and if we don't make that case, then this doesn't go forward. Um, but I do want people to feel like they understand this and that they've been able to contribute to it and ask those hard questions like we've had the opportunity to do. Um, one further point I wanted to make is that as I was thinking about whether this was the right project for Montpelier, um, I started thinking about all the other things that, that would be nice is the, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could have more um, street festivals, if we could close Langdon Street and make a pedestrian street there, which I'm not proposing we do that tonight, but gosh, we can't even think about that right now because we need that parking. Um, and there are so many possibilities that having that parking problem solved frees up for us, um, including you know the affordable housing at Christchurch possibility or um, some other projects that we've heard about where people said, oh, if I could get a few more spaces, I would do this. Um, and we're not making this decision based on, on those things because they are not done deals. Those, are, those could happen, as Jack said, but they're not, they're not done. Um, but as I've been weighing this, those certainly have, you know, this is, this is a way to get there. The final comment I want to make is that I don't go near Burlington if I can help it. I hate Burlington. I think there's too much traffic. It's too much of a big city for me. I am a small town person at this point. Um, the only reason I ever go to Burlington is because I know that I can park in their parking garage on Church Street, and then I don't have to deal with driving around and parking. Um, and so I started thinking about that, about Montpelier. And there are people who don't come to Montpelier because parking is a pain. And if they had a garage where they could park, they would come to Montpelier. Um, and so that's also played a, a role in my thinking about this project is, you know, without those parking garages on Church Street, I would never go to Church Street. Um, and I'm wondering how many folks are out there who feel the same way about Montpelier. So those are a few of my comments. <laughs> um, We'll turn it over to Ann. Well, do you want to talk at all or, uh, a little bit about opportunities the public does have to weigh in or further further opportunities? Well, so there's the, um, so let's talk first about the sort of legal steps that we have to follow. Okay. And then I think we can add more if that's important. I think it would be helpful if there's a signal to move forward to allow us to start putting some of these agreements, you know, to keep moving this ball forward as opposed to stalling for September 12. Um, but that said, and we we're also planning to be talking about the wastewater plan on September 12, which I suspect will be equally as long and complicated. But, but that is amazing. So the legal requirement is we have, you know, tonight's meeting, and then we have to hold a special meeting to warn the, the ballot vote. And I think the, the thought would be that w there would be nothing else on the agenda that night other than the one, two, three, or four ballot items being considered. So that would obviously be the last chance for people to weigh in to convince the council not to put it on the bond vote. Um, you know, I know I would be certainly willing to host a 
workshop meeting if people want to come in and I think certainly questions like the design of the, the garage whether it's flat or tall you know those aren't done deals I mean we've got to move that quickly but th they can certainly be looked at within certain timing and financial parameters and you know I don't know if the council wants to create a small group or have a design workshop or something like that where people can come in and weigh in on um, one of the reasons we wanted to get and I, I, I do know that this only came out last night but knowing that the council had over a month before it had to make a decision to give people time to digest this and ask questions and ask, you know, answer, ask. I'm happy to answer them at any time. Uh, and, and then, of course, if you choose to put on the bond vote, there will be another public information hearing. And, of course, people can, their ultimate citizen participation is when they check the yes or no box um, but we can we can certainly add more if people want but those are the, the, the things we have to do is the, the special meetings thank you um, so I want to thank all of those who uh, offered comments tonight you know whether they were for it or against it I think uh, you know all of those comments add um, you know important uh, richness to this discussion and sort of like like Rosie was saying I mean I think that it, it really does make this project better um, when we have lots of different minds on it um, so I, I also want to make a comment that I, I liked John's suggestion of the flat you know insofar as we can explore that I'm, I'm also interested in that um, for potential future you know opportunities um, so I'm I'm also um, very excited about this. I, I I've been we've been talking about parking um, since I got on the council, and it will just be such a delight to be moving forward um, on on a project. And uh, and I am also excited to uh, free up space potentially um, on street. So um, with all that in mind, you know I'll, I'll just leave it at that because I don't want to be redundant. People have been very um, articulate. Um, other other thoughts, and then I think we should do I something or not. Just wanted to add that I do not wish to start a feud with the Burlington City Council. <laughs> they have a very nice city. I just do, I prefer not to I spend a lot of time. You can give them praise. You go. You have a the poor man's um, Montpelier. <laughs> <laughs> um, Donna? Under recommended action, there seems to be like three parts here. Yeah. So I was going to start with the motion to approve the agreement terms with Capital Plaza, authorize city manager to complete and execute the final contract. So is that your motion? That's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? So okay. I would... I would really prefer to wait until September 12th to do that, just because Bill gave a great presentation, and I want folks to have the opportunity to watch it. I want folks to have the opportunity to read about it in the paper, um, and you know, make those further comments. And then, if we did want to make any changes to the um, contract with Capital Plaza or, or any further um, alterations that. We, we haven't bound ourselves um, without hearing that further public comment. So there are three parts to this. Is there any one part in particular or, or just all of it? I, mean, I just want to be clear on what you're objecting to. Well, if the motion doesn't get a second, it doesn't... It, oh, no, it, it did get a second. It did. Oh, did? Thank you, I, I seconded it so we Thank could you. talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that. Sorry, I'm just trying to pull it up and I got signed out. I, I'm sure it's probably easier for you to like look at it, otherwise I'd just tell you, but. Can I ask a procedural question? Yes. Uh, whatever happens with this motion, can we set a date for the public hearing on a possible November bond vote, whether or not we vote yay or nay? Yeah, we do have to set, and quite frankly, you know, if we proceed with the wastewater bond and if we proceed with some of the charter changes that have been talking, you're going to have to hold that hearing for that purpose and as well. Um, because it's uh, this is 17. It's a typo. It should be. It has to be the 27th to the 7th, somewhere in that window. And our normal meetings on the 26th. Yes. So I'm I'm back to if we don't pass my motion, can we still set a date 
for the possible November bond vote tonight. Oh, you can Just do that whether you other. said it or not. Okay. Okay. I wasn't. <laughs> In fact, I hope you do. <laughs> So I did yep. find that, um, so I guess I would be fine with, with setting the date so people can uh, plan around it, um, so that number three. Um, and I think I would be okay with directing the city manager to complete the n some of those next steps are just, and I'm not the one who gets to, we all make this decision together, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're letting people know how you're going to vote whether this motion passed. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bill, can you describe real quick what those next steps are? Because I'm not finding them right in front of me. Sure. Uh, um, two, yeah, there's a whole second list. Page. Um, the second page, midway. Yeah, so we, you know, obviously the VEPC approval we're going to do, I assume, no matter what. Yeah. Uh, the phase one, we've got to move on. The finalizing with our contractors. Again, we're not going to get too far down the road until we know we have money, but we need to do some of it. You know, if we're going to look at design options, we're going to have to spend some of that we're working out the parking systems. Uh, I think getting stuff ready for to go to for permit, uh, finalizing the use of 60 State Street. Those that's not a, a big cost there. I think the main thing is, you know, we would obviously we wouldn't secure any other parking tenants until the bond passed, but we would certainly would start talking to people about that, um, and that would be helpful. You know, I, I understand, and I, I'm certainly all for the, having the public have as much participation. I also note it's three weeks before our next meeting, so it would be sort of three weeks where we might be in a little bit of a hold. I'm sure the sheriffs in the Capitol Plaza would like to know that we're on board with their the general terms of the deal. Um, you know, we, we could set the final approval of it because you will, there will be a final contract. We could do that. But um, whatever, whatever people are comfortable moving forward with or not, I mean, it's your, it is your decision, not mine. Can you describe a little bit more how doing final approval might work? Well, I think the, so the way, the way this was, um, I, I had written it in that you would, uh, you would approve the general terms and then we would just finalize the thing. We could always set, set it that you're approving these general terms, but the actual written contract comes back for council approval as opposed to authorizing me to just go ahead and finish it. How do other folks feel about that? I mean, if I'm just by myself here, then we can. <laughs> I'd like to see my motion move forward as is. I'd like us to progress. Um, um, yeah, go ahead, Glenn. Uh, I feel as though it would be good to have some amount of delay, but it's it's hard for me to say for sure one way or the other. <laughs> I would vote for either the motion as, as uh, or a, a delay, honestly. I, I think either would be a positive move for me. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've added a whiteboard uh, off to the side here with our um, upcoming agenda items. So in case you're ever wondering, um, what, what are we going to be working on? Um, we have things projected out. Um, my, I, I'm also feeling a little torn about this because I, you know, I appreciate public input and I want the, you know, the public to have the opportunity to uh, weigh in um, and, you know, keep our, our, our thinking um, sort of open-handed. Um, but uh, September 12th is looking pretty full. Um, so I'm a little, I'm, a, I'm just worried about that. So I, I, I'm going to, I'm leaning towards um, uh, doing also, you know, moving it forward um, tonight and then, you know, knowing that like, um, there, there will be still other opportunities for the public to comment we and weigh in. We have two more public hearings. Yeah. Can, can I just weigh one, one more thing in, too? This is just a technical point. That, to, that any contract or anything that is done is 100% contingent on a bond passing, and that means it's contingent on whether you vote to put the bond mm -hmm. onto a ballot. So we can't you know, legally bind us to too far down the road without anything. So I just, you know... It's really a, the signal that we're we're at least working in the same direction and we're moving forward. But it, you know, even if we sign a contract and then it, the bond either doesn't pass or doesn't go on the ballot, then contract or the TIF doesn't pass. I mean, the whole thing could go out the window next Thursday if they don't pass our TIF, right? So, um, Glenn, do you need a minute? Are you okay? I'm fine. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just gonna. <laughs> sort of say what I've already said. I just feel like the public has to have an opportunity, a meaningful opportunity to weigh in on this. And 
I just, I don't, I'd be happy to schedule a special meeting between, uh, so we can divide up that agenda. But I, this is a huge ask of taxpayers and residents and everyone who participates in our community. And I just feel like people really need to, we need to get city buy-in on this, right? Because our city is the one responsible for this. And I, I just, I don't want to circumvent the public process in the name of getting this done for the sake of getting it done. And I, I just, I'm really uncomfortable with having city staff go forward and negotiate, you know, figure out contract terms and all of that when there are other things that need attention right now as well. Um, and I just want to make sure that we give city staff clear guidance. Um, I, I think that's something the council's been working on over the years to be really clear about what we're asking. Um, and for me, I want to have one more opportunity for the public to weigh in and then and then have a vote on Donna's motion. I mean, everybody knows what my vote would be, but you know, I, I just I think it's important that the public have an opportunity to 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 watch this meeting uh, and then to oops um, and then to to be able to reach out to all of us council members so that if they have questions and can't be here, they can get those questions asked and answered next time. Uh, Connor, that's it's a part of special meeting between now and the twelfth. Um, I think it's looking a little crowded on the twelfth, so. Uh, might be hesitant to add it there. Fine with me. Other thoughts? So if... No, oh, then you don't know. Yeah, um, yes, Jack? Sorry. I'm not sure if a special meeting is what we need. Um, I, I think I value the idea of public input, though, and so at some point before we have a public hearing on the bond vote, I think it does make sense to uh, to tell Bill tonight, well, go forward, keep working on it, get everything developed, but come back to the council for contract approval. And I don't know if December, September 26th is too late for that or because uh, that's, I think, probably what I would suggest if we, uh, if people want to go in that direction. You'd suggest putting it on September 26th? Yeah, what does it look like? Oh, yeah, that's short, short. tonight. Yeah. Now it's short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know what happens. Yeah. Uh, yes, Donna. And I know, actually, I just take a little bit back of such flat statements. I, I don't feel that I've neglected the public, and, and I'm not not open to more and we do have two official public hearings and we can have a workshop with the final uh, material as the staff moves ahead between now but we do have these clear deadlines and and so I I'm not, my vote's not going to change and indeed we have time to make changes to suggestions such as what John did with oh let's think about this maybe it should be flat I don't think any of that really affects the big picture of what they're moving forward with and what we're going to then be discussing for the bond vote is all the final details and really soliciting public support at that time. And so I feel very comfortable voting on it tonight. Sure, and I, I would like to call the question. Um, okay. So one possibility is, well, we can talk about what happens if it doesn't get voted up. I think we I need to vote I first. Should, I think we gotta vote first. Well, well, yeah, Phil, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna offer um, that I'd be happy to host a workshop meeting on this next Wednesday, the 29th in the evening as a manager's staff workshop, open to the public. People can come and ask. Great. Council can come if they want. It won't be a warrant council meeting, nothing to vote. Um, so people can have an opportunity to review it, but it, it would be good I, as I say, you're not voting officially on anything until you vote to put it on the ballot. That's when you're actually putting your hand up to say you are going forward. So, and Bill, is it a problem for you if we, if the council doesn't <clears throat> vote to approve until the 12th or the 26th? It, it would be better if it was approved sooner. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just it just. I mean, there's going to be uncertainty until the end. That's the nature of a public process. And um, but on one hand, we're trying to marshal forces to get in moving on something. And, and I think if they're sensing, you know, we don't know if this is really going to happen, you know, everyone's resources are going to go, you know. And, um, and so I, OK, thanks. Maybe there's a, something in between that can be worded a statement of support 
to move forward without a commitment or something like that. But I think, um, you know, everyone, people are, you know, companies that are, you know, architects and those stuff, you know, they're not really getting paid until the bond passes and they're doing work. Um, you know, the, the Capital Plaza is certainly putting a lot of their uh, money up to, to develop the project. So there are people that are waiting on uh, where the city's at with this, or at least, you know, understanding that there's a bond vote coming, or, or potentially coming. But I will commit to a, a open public session next Wednesday if anybody wants it. And maybe not make that a special council meeting. Anyway, you've called the question. We should vote. Long time ago. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, it works, just that, for the record. How, how does it work, John? It's the previous question, and it is essentially a motion that needs to be seconded, and it has to it be passed by a two-third two-thirds majority. It was seconded? Yes. Jack? No. No, not the, the call not the question. The, the, the Donna's motion, motion the was question. Right, right, right. No, I mean the calling the yeah. question. It's called previous question, two-thirds right. majority. That's because she didn't realize she had to get a second. Oh, thank you. Yep. Good point. People got talking, and I didn't interrupt them. I apologize. Um, all right, well, let's, I think Just we should vote. So I'm, I'm confused. Okay. <laughs> what are we voting on right now? Donna's motion. Okay. And did you say two-thirds have to... No. 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 That's for calling the question. Nobody okay. seconded. Nobody seconded. So we're just right. okay. seconded. Yeah. Right. Parliamentarian. I'm good. Um, yeah, I'm a really great parliamentarian. So just to be clear, <laughs> this is about um, approving the agreement. It, it was the first part, right, Donna? Yes. The first sentence within our agenda. In our approve agreement terms with Capital Plaza, authorized city manager to complete and execute the final contract. Um, all right. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, so I think that's four. So yep. the motion passes. Um, do you want to do the second part? Sure. I'll make a motion to direct the city manager to complete the next steps required for this project as outlined in the attached memo. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay, and the last part, do you want to? It okay. would be a motion to set the date between September 17th and October. It's 27th, sorry. 27th, sorry. sorry. Right, September 27th and October 7th for a public hearing on a possible November 6th bond vote on this project. Yes, yeah, so that, this would be the meeting when you actually approve a warning yes. and put, you know, approve the ballot, the items that are on it. Um, as I said, this as many as four that you're talking about. Um, so we need to have hold that, we need to set the date for that, which would be good just for planning purposes to know what our, even if we decide not to do any of them, and we can always cancel the meeting, but. And that's what that October 2nd? Yeah, I had suggested October 2nd, um, just had picked it, but it could be as early as, you know, I mean, you could move the September 26th meeting to September 27th, you could do anything you want. I just, Maybe if that's a Tuesday night, I, VLCT town fairs on Wednesday, so I'm going to be out of town on Wednesday that night, so I can't, that's why I don't suggest a Tuesday, but you do it without me. So I apologize, Donna, I, I didn't know, hear if there was a second on that. I don't know either. Yeah, Glenn seconded. Oh, Glenn seconded, I'm sorry. Hey, should, we haven't picked a date yet, have we? Mm -hmm. No, but it's vague. Well, you said something Well, I know, well, I, I mean, the, the hint was pick the date. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it has to be sometime. <laughs> So that's why the set a date and then the between the two dates was in parentheses. Like pick one. <laughs> Sorry if that wasn't date. clear. <laughs> Looked at everything. Um, okay. so. this, actually, there has not been a second on this third one. Which? No, no, because we haven't decided what it is. I don't know what right. the motion is. Yet. Okay. Um, do you, you want to? So well, so see. do we want to talk about the second or some other time? I like the second. You like the second. It's a Tuesday, just so everyone knows. I won't be here. I'll be out of the country until... That entire week? I leave right after the council meeting on the 26th. And I get so back. even if we moved it to the 27th, nope. it wouldn't do anything. So I get back on the 10th, the day before the next council meeting. Right. So tonight. you're gone that entire... I took yeah. it between council meetings. Right. I'm flying to Sweden. Yeah, I have a conflict on the 2nd, but uh, that's... Probably the only night that week that I have a conflict. This is the fourth. I can't do the fourth. I teach on Thursday nights. I mean, we can do the third. How about the third? Here. The third one? Third Wednesday. Third. Bill, did you say you couldn't be here at all? Well, I'm supposed to not be here, but I, I, I'm supposed to be in South Burlington. I can come back. 
I mean, this is important. And there's also the 27th of September. Yeah, you can always do the next night, 27th. Oh, the 27th? Which doesn't. It's a Thursday, December. but you're still probably I, teaching. Yeah, still, I teach still on Thursdays. still no Thursday. good for you. Sorry, right. Yeah. So I, I move that we set up, schedule a uh, public hearing for, uh, or a special meeting or whatever, for uh, October 3rd. Okay. Okay, is there a second? I'll second, second that. Uh, any further discussion about that? You'll have a quorum. I won't be here. Okay, I, if there works for everybody else, good. I think mm -hmm. anybody else not be able to be here. Okay. All right. Uh, great. So um, no further discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Nay. Okay. Thank you. But <laughs> um, just because I'm looking at my calendar right now, um, 6.30, 7. 6.30. Sure. 6 .30. And Jamie will send out a calendar invite. Okay. And, okay. and can, can I just, that? yes. So I just wanted to clarify that um, my vote against uh, approving the initial contract tonight is, uh, or the terms of the agreement tonight is not um, opposition to the project. I would just have been more comfortable with more um, time for public comment before that. So I'm generally um, supportive of the project. Thank you, Rosie. All right, and I, yeah, I think we should probably take a five minute break. I'm so off on my timing. Six, Goodbye, seven. Stephanie. Six, <laughs> Um, uh, Stephanie reminded us that we actually have one other um, element that we need to get done in conjunction with the, the previous uh, piece. So I'm going to turn it over to Bill to talk about this other So um, just a thing. minor thing that um, Stephanie did remind me that VEPSI had wanted to make sure there was a motion in the record that the council approved amending the VEPSI plan to reflect the larger garage. We talked about it last time. You did the head nod, but they, so I was going to ask that be added. So if you could just, again, it's only a plan. And it, it and this theoretically needs to happen before the before VEPC next meeting Thursday's meeting on Thursday. So I move we amend, amend the VEPSI plan to uh, incorporate the larger parking garage design. Okay. Second. Further discussion. Favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Nay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, so moving on. Um, so we are looking at an ordinance uh, really regarding um, the parking and such around uh, the elementary school. Yeah, do you want to come on up? Tom's going old school. All right, the poster. Everybody has this uh, map in your packet. Uh, I know it's a little small, but uh, really more for the public benefit or if you want me to answer any questions specifically. So, good evening. Good evening. Tom McArdle, Director of Public Works. Protected by Chief Ficus. <laughs> <laughs> the key word here on tonight. Um, so, City Council approved uh, the closure of Park Avenue at the request of the, of the school um, for uh, a temporary uh, use as a um, supplemental playground while they're undergoing their project. Um, it was with the understanding um, that there would be. Um, some necessary uh, parking impacts with that that would have to be addressed by ordinance. Um, so returning tonight um, as um, expected to provide that, um, those parking um, ordinance revisions. Um, you have a memo from me um, dated August 7th and um, I don't see anybody from the school tonight but um, they sure if uh, they were going to be here tonight, but um, really this is a, the city business as to how we address our, our parking needs and how we accommodate um, parking needs and, and impacts as a result of the, of the closure. Um, so with that, the, um, there were really five points that were part of that original plan. There was alternative on-street parking arrangements for staff and school visitors. Um, and these are on the plans as uh, A, B, C, D, and E on the original list, um, reserved on-street parking spaces for Park Avenue tenants. Um, 
two directional traffic flow on the section of Park Avenue that will remain open. Remember that is a one-way street. Um, parking restrictions at Loomis Liberty Intersection, intersection to, a, to accommodate these uh, school buses that will be turning through a residential neighborhood and reserving su sufficient space on the southerly side of Hubbard Street to allow for um, the school buses to load on Hubbard instead of on uh, Loomis. Um, so really creating a new ordinance, if you will, um, and it's all temporary, so it's a new temporary, or it's a new subsection under uh, Chapter 10, Article 7. Um, 10 two, 725 is temporary prohibited and, and limited parking. Um, it would give the, with your approval, and this is the first of two public hearings that we're required to do, um, but with your approval, you would authorize the city manager to um, to put into effect these uh, various parking ordinances, which shall expire and be no, of no further effect upon the reopening of Park Avenue, which shall uh, approximately coincide with the completion of the Union School project. Um, there is... Uh, one section in here that is uh, considered permanent, um, something that we noticed, uh, seems like every time we get in here we find some housekeeping measure that we need to do. Um, nobody ever parks on the side of Hubbard Street uh, between, it's the westerly side between Liberty and Park Avenue. Um, so it should be non-controversial in making that permanent and it's certainly important for uh, circulation. Um, there's also one amendment to this um, memorandum um, which uh, came to my attention through one of the uh, people who received our notices of this hearing. Um, Glenn, um, I think, was speaking to, uh, I forget his name, at the corner of Liberty and Loomis. Dave Bellini. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so I had, did have a typo in there and appreciate that um, correction. Um, so it did not affect um, their, their property and his concern specifically. So on Park Avenue, the um, again, we have to technically make a one section of that street two-way. So that's 10 to 510, um, and that's note two on the plan. And interrupt me at any time if you'd like. I can go over to the board and answer questions if you'd like. Can I interrupt you about sure. your last statement about the uh, his. Uh, Dave Bellini, his parents live there, right, uh, and they're right. quite elderly, and I believe his mother mm -hmm. needs a wheelchair for mobility. So their property is not impacted. They'll be able to park on either side of Liberty? That's correct. Okay. So they'll be able to get in and out from that side entrance. Right. So <clears throat> their home is here in this corner, mm -hmm. and the concern was being able to park around Right, both sides. Yes. Um, the the <laughs> restrictions proposed is, is this corner, and and on this corner. Okay. So the bus will be making this this movement. So no impact on no his impact side. On his okay. Side. Correct. Okay. Um, I don't want to interrupt you if you have more things you want to share, Tom. Go ahead. Oh, oh, did you have something, Tom? I just have one thing I just wanted to add. Um, we had a meeting this afternoon. The result, there was definitely the potential that part of this may have to be modified because we need to see how this, this flows. So part of that would be if we have to increase a restricted area for no parking, um, it would be for temporary order of police, but we would notify you if we had to. One of the concerns is that wintertime operations, this is a, uh, for, for decades, this has been controversial in terms of the, the width of Liberty Street. So. We need to monitor this very carefully because of, of the new regular impact uh, of traffic flow of the buses and as well as um, how we're going to deal with uh, a temporary street closure for the loading and unloading, which technically happens anyway once those red lights go on the buses. Uh, so I just, that's my only piece there, that we're going to have to be fluid on this, monitor it closely, and making sure that um, Everything can, uh, it's, 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 not, it's, it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of uh, growing pains with this project and I think a lot, a lot of tweaks here and there on the part of just pe uh, people traveling through using any of those streets, like Liberty Street, for example, uh, as an alternative to other, you know, as cut-throughs. Um, and also, uh, as, and, and as much clarity as the school can have for parents on, in terms of where are the uh, drop, you know, safe drop-off areas that might not be 
as convenient um, and things like that to minimize impact. So we're going to get a test of this um, starting, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Um, starting next week. Um, while this ordinance is still uh, underway, yeah. um, we will uh, have to implement this um, immediately. Um, so in fact, signs are already in place. I so should have had them bagged because that's some questions have already been raised. But um, the the concern about the, the Liberty Street section between um, Loomis and Hubbard uh, with cars parked on both sides of the street. Um, a lot of that is parking from elsewhere. Years ago, we did a license plate study and found that many people are not that park there are not residents of that particular neighborhood. Um, so this is um, this kind of overflow, overspill from the downtown area or and school staff. Um, and so that's essentially one way. Will that be a problem? Will that be something that we have to address immediately and have to return um, to uh, uh, seek more, a more formal approval of a parking restriction there? The parking of buses on Hubbard Street will um, as uh, Chief Fakus mentioned, they will activate their red lights. Um, that will not necessarily be visible to somebody turning from Liberty um, onto Hubbard, and then we'll encounter what could be up to 20 minutes of a stop bus um, essentially closing the street. Uh, that could be problematic, and we know uh, all of the, the locals, all of us locals here know how to cut around downtown. Um, and if we'd like to avoid uh, that and, and Liberty Hubbard and, and College Street, certainly part of that bypass route, if you will. Um, so we're toying with the idea of, of possibly um, alert, putting up a sign, um, variable message type of sign, uh, displaying that the street is uh, essentially closed um, so that we don't have um, um, unknowing, unwitting um, motorists entering Liberty and then having to try to turn around or do something like what the school um, transportation folks are concerned about is uh, forcing the issue and possibly going around the red lights, um, creating a dangerous situation. So this is fluid. Um, this is something that we need the latitude to address. Go ahead, Donna. I'm one of those that cut through there constantly. And, Me too. And my little <clears throat> Honda Civic, it's narrow. There's cars on both sides 90% of the time. Daytime, evening time, it's just amazing. So I would definitely think you'd need to have some major signage as to what's changing in the traffic. It's, it's a very busy street before snow happens. If I can add just, just two general points and, and a little bit of uh, history, uh, you know, there, and Chief Gowans isn't here right now, but you know, I'd be really, uh, it's always been a concern. You know, for example, the largest uh, truck that they have is, is Tower, is the, the Tower One. Uh, and can that, in the wintertime, can it truly get through if you have people, people park on both sides? There was a discussion um, many years ago about just having a prohibition of parking on one side of the street so we could um, safely accommodate. And also, just interestingly, you know, as far as how this conversation dovetails with the one you all just had, regardless of your side of it, but this is also now we're dealing with the, you know, the, the, the impact of our own strategy, if you will, of parking. Uh, and my sister lives on Liberty Street, and, you know, and there's times when, you know, she could barely squeeze in and out of, out of her, her driveway, and, uh, and it's all the time. I mean, so it's not just faculty members from the school or workers. Um, it's a real challenge, and, and, and so uh, we always, from a policing perspective, I'm always concerned about just the general quality of life in, in all of our neighborhoods here in Montpelier. So I just want to throw that out there and as we think about how all of this, that, you know, that, 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 you know, that ebb and flow of one action here, one, you know, and, and uh, so. Okay. So um, at this point, unless you have more you want to add? Well, I'm wondering if, if um, the council would like to, us to suggest an amendment to what we've proposed based on what Chief Fakus has, has um, stated about um, you know, the concern about that. Um, the, the next uh, council hearing for this would be on the 12th, um, whether or not we should amend this now and, and get the word out to folks, particularly on Liberty Street, that was, would impact um, if if that's what we should do, or, or possibly, and I, this may be um, um, 
certainly a little unorthodox, but would the council consider granting um, or authorizing the city manager, police chief, to um, uh, take um, action as necessary, as, as you deem necessary to maintain um, and achieve um, two-way traffic flow on these streets, um, based on what we find? So I have too many things going on in my head right now. So um, uh, the thing that I'm feeling pressed on right now is that I, I did not technically open the public hearing. So, um, so I'm going to officially do that. Um, so opening the, the public hearing. And so along with that, so um, Chief Focus, you had some um, suggestions about uh, like if things need to be sort of amended on the fly. Well, or? That's, yeah, I mean, we could. You know, so we, we at any time, if the public safety is impacted, we can effectively get the tr buses or emergency vehicles through any street in Montpelier. Uh, we do this regularly with the snowbanks. Langdon Street, I think, is the best known example of that. Mm -hmm. We'll put in signs, temporary order of police, no parking. Um, until we can, uh, that situation can either be rectified, such as, you know, uh, snow removal or another, whatever is causing that, that impact. So the challenge that we have is this is an unusual traffic pattern, uh, different types of traffic. Um, so again, I'm simply, my area of concern if we had an impact, if we had to change something, would be this side of the street between Loomis and Hubbard. So we can guarantee that the buses aren't going to be able to make these, this turn. Because even if we have, you know, as, as the order states, the prohibition about parking here, uh, it can still be really tight, uh, depending on so it might be an illegally parked space, but their vehicle might be larger than others. Um, that's, so that would be an area of, of, of mm -hmm. I could see potentially having to, to implement an emergency order of prohibition of parking. <coughs> so so you, are, are you suggesting that we amend this ordinance to include prohibition of parking up there at this point, or do you want to wait and see how it goes? Um, I can... <laughs> Well, you're going to have to react very quickly. Um, once a bus is impeded, um, it's kind of a, a domino yeah. effect um, until that vehicle is moved. So if it happened once, happens once, it's happened too much, um, and there's a reason for police action. Yeah. Um, we can only foresee so much. Um, so, or we could be proactive and act an ordinance under this, under the temporary, consider permanent down the road sometime. Um, and then only only implement what we deem necessary. Scale it back if that's if that makes sense. Ashley, do you have something? I do, and so I, I'm not familiar with bus routes in Montpelier. Have there always been buses that have taken this turn or these turns? No, no. This is a brand new. Only because pattern. of the playground project. Because um, uh, yeah. used to go in front of the school. Yeah. Right. They, right. Over. I just wasn't sure if they yeah. used to go that way for something and, else. And just one other one other piece of how historically it did operate. Uh, there were those Jersey barriers that right. were painted. Uh, to provide a protected corridor for for you know dropping you know the dropping off and picking up of, of the kids and they did not have to operate right. their lights, lights which worked great so, so. so um, you know, we're not even we still don't even know and this this doesn't even take we're just this part of the ordinance the plan we're talking about the school buses there's going to be a lot of other factors such as all the 10 wheel dump trucks traffic that is going to be taking out you know the, the you know that the concerned soil uh, and what is that going to look like how often are they going to be up and down school street onto main street or you know so there's going to be a lot of that's why we you know i'm here to talk about that we need we might have to tweak various traffic patterns and and if so we can certainly notify council of our actions and if we see a longer term strategy and we are working closely with the school again this is not a city project but it's but we're here to help facilitate the traffic management of it and also the safety of those working in that environment in our kids. Um, so there's a lot of other things that are happening. And this is a big project, and, um, and we don't have a lot of traffic options. And that's what's been so challenging for us. One of the advantages about amending the proposal tonight for first reading is that then we can get notice to the neighbors so if they want to come out and comment at second reading the other advantage is we will i mean we won't have winter conditions i hope between now and the next meeting <laughs> but we will have had a couple of weeks of school operation to see what mm -hmm. might need to be changed um, so the the amendment that you would be suggesting would be to amend the ordinance to provide that uh, parking is only on one side of 
the street of, of Liberty Street uh, on that, that section. block. So the 40 foot length on the uh, southerly side would extend to Hubbard under um, 10716. The heading on that is Liberty and Loomis and Liberty intersection. Um, so we would we would revise that. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Do we need to vote on that? You just vote. You I mean it's the first reading, so you just vote to preliminary amend it. You know, you, you can still change it next meeting when you adopt the final version. But this way, we can send. We have three weeks to get notice out to people and say, "Here's the, the final version." Because yeah. okay. this did come up before, motion. and there was some pushback against it. So. Um, Second your motion, Jack. All right. Okay. Um, before we vote on that, I, this is technically a public hearing, so if there's anyone from the public who would like to comment on that, you're certainly welcome, of course. Uh, okay. So, and so is your motion this both this amendment and um, moving second. To second, uh, reading to second reading for the next. So, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy Just wanted to, do to make that. sure I'm clear. Yeah. Um, we're, and we're you're good with that. Yeah. Are you good? Well, I'm going to change. My <laughs> okay. Else. It's both this amendment and <laughs> voting to move or to pass first reading. Um, okay. So, uh, Connor. And Mayor, I'll just have to recuse myself on this one. I work for Vermont NEA, represent classroom teachers, support professionals. Okay. They're the affected parties. So. Okay. We send this one out. All right. Sounds good. Um, all right. All in, I, yes. I guess I just want to make sure. Do we know when we'll send notice? When we'll send notice out to impacted residents by with this new proposal? Because I, yes. I, I just I, I received a few people like a few inquiries, chiefly from Mr. Bellini, but um, he received it on Saturday for today's meeting, and he was really concerned about not being able to make it and if we hadn't been able to connect. So I just want to make sure that we get notice out to all potentially impacted residents so that they can reach out to all of us and we can sort of field any questions that we might get and pass them on to to Bill and, and Tom and Chief. At the latest, it will go out um, by next week. Okay. I will not be here on the 12th, so I want to get this done and move on. So. Another reason to do it, so. <laughs> but yours is more valid. <laughs> Good okay, answer. Great. Appreciate your candor, friend. <laughs> all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. We work you. on this. All right. So um, I'm going to ask a question of the public. Um, is there anyone here for the Parklet Ordinance revision? Okay. Oh. oh okay. Um, so. I just want to make sure you don't take away the no smoking. That's all. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I, just because I think there might be people here for another for other items, I'm going to shift that one yeah. um, to the next later. I don't think the no smoking is an issue. I don't think the no smoking thing is an issue, Ginny. No one's going to change that. And we all support it. I think. Okay. Yeah. Just so you know. Um, so I'm going to move up the. Um, I'm going to move the parklet to after the ash borer conversation. So we're going to move now to the creation of Confluence Park, and then we'll um, talk about the ash borer recommendations. So um, uh, uh, Ricardo and VRC crew, if you are in Parks Commission, if you want to come on up, now's a good time. Jeff, you want to come up? Um, so I, I feel like I should probably introduce this one um, a little bit since I it was uh, the, I was the submitting uh, party on this. Um, so just a little background: we um, uh, have the opportunity to uh, create uh, a park uh, as a part of a like a, an official city park. Um, now that One Taylor Street is. Uh, finally under construction, which is very exciting. Um, and so even though Confluence Park is not done yet, um, uh, my hope in this item is that we can um, ask city staff to uh, create, uh, well, to, to note it on the city website that it's at least coming soon. And um, I, I know VRC um, has some thoughts about the uh, uh, process of working together with city committees um, to make uh, that uh, well, to, to get public input uh, as to what it should look like. So uh, I want to give you uh, the opportunity, Ricardo and um, Steve, right? Yes, uh, to, to, to come in and tell us what you're thinking for this space. Thank you. So I'm Ricarda Erickson of the Vermont River Conservancy. And Steve Libby. Steve Libby, Executive Director. And um, I guess we, we prepared a statement for the council and didn't prepare anything to read. 
Um, but I guess we, we're really excited for this opportunity to look at the design opportunities for this Confluence Park. Um, we feel it in our, in our research and looking into it, we found historical documents, some of which Anne included with the agenda today, that date back 23 years ago, people have been discussing this in the city, this, this need for a Confluence Park. And Vermont River Conservancy is very much focused on public access to our rivers, as well as protecting the land alongside our rivers. So for those, those reasons, we're uh, drawn to this project. And also, interestingly, as after talking about the, the parking garage, I also want to emphasize that this confluence park could be a tremendous opportunity for economic uh, growth in our city. Um, imagine driving across the bridge by Shaz and Sarducci and seeing a beautiful park, seeing people in the water down there. Imagine <laughs> that, and a place to have your lunch, a place to go listen to music. So this park could bring a lot to the city in general. I don't know, Steve, if you have anything to add or if there are any questions that we could answer. And um, I also want to um, make sure if Jeff or Dan, you know, if you have any comments on on this, I want to certainly give you an opportunity to to talk about this as well. Um, Dan Dickerson from the Parks Commission. Uh, I will just say briefly that we discussed this um, park idea last night at our meeting. We're all very enthusiastic about it. Um, we want to be partners with. Um, the Vermont River Conservancy in any way we can. And we took an official vote and the motion passed 402 to support the creation of the park and to be partners in, in the creation and the ongoing maintenance of the park. And we're definitely, we're really psyched about it. So I think it'll be great and that's all I'll say. Great, thank you. And Jeff, if you want to add something, you certainly can, you don't have to. I'm not sure it's new, but it's exciting. <laughs> possibility of a downtown park that has a relationship with the river and gets people in a short walking distance to uh, really feel the, the resource that we have and to take advantage of it and, and probably the, the biggest way yet. Uh, so uh, I, I'm excited about the prospect. Great. So any questions? Uh, Ashley and then Rosie and then Donna. So I'm curious in terms of like city maintenance, I'm assuming that this would fall to you. Um, and and I, I read John's email also in response to Bill's piece about uh, staffing. Um, and I think it's become pretty clear that the city is over capacity already in terms of staff ability, you know, just staff capacity. Um, and with the Emerald Ash Borer, coupled with this really exciting park, I feel like, yes, I can say yes to something tonight. Uh, <laughs> um, I just, I want to make sure that as a city, we do our part in supporting this, which I think is going to translate into more staff resources to make sure that we are meeting current plus new demands. Any comments on that? Um, I'll just say that, yes, we, we do have staffing issues. We do have resource issues. Um, there you go. Um, and, and we're going to do, as a Parks Commission, we're going to do our due diligence to present you with a budget that tries to sort of capture you know, some, of, some of these existing responsibilities that may be fallen by the wayside or have been sort of you know, not um, addressed as much as they should, as well as you know, these new responsibilities. Um, you know, I think taking care of Admiral Ashmore is, is vitally important. I think the establishment of this park in this key area of the city is vitally important. Otherwise, you know, we might have more concerns about creating the park, but, you know, we can't pass this up. And so, you know, we're, um, we're going to work with the city council to, to give you a budget that, you know, hopefully doesn't explode, but also, you know, acknowledges these, the new responsibility and, and hopefully the city council would is ready to work with us on finding the middle ground and, and doing what we need to do. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, Rosa? So I'm a little bit confused about where exactly this is, and I should have asked for a map earlier. I'm wondering if we can pull something up so we can have sure. a better sense. I, I see the attachments, but the attachments are, I think, covering some land covered by 
yeah, one so Taylor. So they, I'm, right, and those pictures don't necessarily include the Taylor Street um, design. So I, um, I actually have here somewhere um, an image of the the Taylor Street uh, design. I mean, and my understanding is we're just accepting the stand behind Shaw's and look across North Branch. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's the, yeah. the corner of yeah, the front. Yeah, you okay. must just like text you this picture. I'd like to the public know what we're talking about, too. It's just the very end of. And Taylor we own this land already? We do. Okay. Yep. It's just between basically the edge. I mean, the, the vision at this yep. point, anyway, is just between the edge of the parking lot all the way to the bank. Okay. Um, yeah. Does that help? And we're basically just agreeing tonight to have this help in yeah. designing this, right? Yep. Okay, great. And to list it on the city website with just like a coming soon. You know, we don't, it's not done and that's okay. With a, with a big request for a, a budget that actually meets all of the needs for this because I don't want to build it and then not be able to do what needs to be done to keep it a place where people can be and have fun and do stuff. So you were next? Um, I think. No, Donna. I'm next, but you have. <laughs> Great. Um, well, I'm just a little confused on process okay. because I was around when Taylor Street started and the first design brought up this and removing the dam, but there's been no official motion by this council that I know of to establish this park. So, so I would think we would need to do that, that we at least want to move forward on it and that's fine if we also want to put it on the website. But I was reading your wonderful letter, and it says you have a grant to contract for a design study, which you'll present to the city at the end of the year. You'll have a conceptual design with cost, budgets, and drawings with three different options. Now, that's including getting rid of the dam? No. Okay, because that's a big component. The, the dam, dam, along with also our uh, flooding issue. Remember, part of the things they wanted to do, uh, which Ann and I have seen on the council. Bill, you maybe help me out here. Uh, but we were presented with a stormwater flooding option. The, the ice jam. Ice jams. That's yes. it. Thank yes. you. And. We really didn't like it very well because <laughs> it didn't move forward with, with really using the river for things like this to happen. So I just feel like we need to have a really holistic look at it, and it's wonderful that you're going to do this piece, but I don't know how we can do this piece without dealing with the dam. So in my um, vision of the future, um, if we're going to move forward with um, a, a any kind of thinking about removing, removing the dams, I think we need to um, specifically have some engineering um, mm -hmm. studies done of that because those dams might be holding up the bank. Um, and that's probably not necessarily even within the, the scope of what they're, you know, they can do at this point. Um, so I'm into having that conversation, um, but we should probably have that, the, the question about the dams separately. Well, other than the initial one Taylor Street proposal to do this park, so that had to be done in order to make this park viable for kayakers, et cetera. So chicken and the egg, if you do, anyway. Yeah. And well, so I think there might be a difference, and I don't know. I'm speaking of out of ignorance here. But one of the parks we heard about was the actual active whitewater park. Mm -hmm. and, yep. And, then, is, okay. and I think yes. that was one. this is, I think, designing an area where people could access the river. But the whitewater did require moving the dam and creating the whitewater. And I don't know if that's exactly what they're talking about here versus just a, a more different type of recreation. Go ahead, Steve. Okay. Yeah, so, so we, we're very aware of all the opportunities uh, at the confluence for different recreational systems, including the Whitewater right. Park. Um, we know that, as the mayor said, that in, in removing the dam or altering the dam is a much larger scope of mm -hmm. inquiry and, and a worthy one, but a much larger one than the, the small grant that we received to look at right. the confluence area itself. But, but we're very aware of that, and I think um, we would, in our discussions with the, the city com the committees and the public, talk about how this confluence park can be part of a larger picture, for sure. Um, but it, it's just outside the scope of what we've been funded for. 
um, in, in this initial phase. But, but we are very aware of that and, and think it's very exciting that there are these recreational opportunities right in downtown Montpelier yep. on the water. Yep. I was just standing down there with Jeff and Ricardo um, a couple days ago, and it's really amazing to stand down kind of below the railroad bridge and get the feel of what it's like to be down at the river level. It's really a whole different experience. So. Yep. Uh, Ashley. I guess the only other concern that I have is I, I want this park to happen, but we also have been kind of talking about what to do with the dam and and all of those issues. And so I'm a bit of a lay person in this arena, but if we were to remove the dam, we talked about how that would change significantly the, the sort of lay of the land in the banks, which could and probably would in some way impact this park, right? Yeah, I, I think if the dam that you're talking about is on the main stem of the Winooski upstream from the from the Main Street Bridge, mm -hmm. so that's quite a distance from this Confluence Park area. No, it's the one, oh, the by, one right by It's Shons. the one that's right so, there. So by the Shons. small dam across the North Branch. No, no. 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 Across so, Winooski. No, but so the one... Okay. You're, you're, you're talking in the about Shaw's the parking lot, you're looking Shaw's right at Shaw's parking lot dam. Okay. So the... You're talking about the same one. <laughs> is not abutting this property that we're looking at for the Confluence Park. So I don't know that there would be a structural issue. It would probably, it's its far enough away that okay. it's, it would probably be fine. Let me okay. give another crack at answering that. So my understanding of the whitewater concept means removing the dam and then channelizing the river so that the water move, would move through that area in a more natural thing and then boulders would be placed. And, yes, yes. And so you cr create a flow that would prevent ice dams, but you'd still have the shells that would have the same capacity of the river, but you just change the nature of the river that would make it much more... Uh, river, natural river, and more kayak and boating friendly. Um, so that channelization would go up the stream. So that dam is not a tall dam. So there, where, and and you can't put whether it's an amphitheater or not is is possible. You you can't really lower that too low anyway. So I think the engineering difference is not going to be okay. significant. And I, and I'm I'm thinking with the little consult that they can figure the. A couple different heights on what that would mean with or without the dam. Okay. Any further things there? Uh, no, because I mean, in your letter you do talk about being flood resistant, so you obviously are looking at different high water marks. Right, and additionally, I just wanted to add that with our point of having three options, you know, three yeah. options is. Obviously, the opportunities, you know, if we had presented a blank canvas to designers, the opportunities could be endless, but we want to have some different, op different options within different budget ranges and within different um, ecological impact um, levels as well. So the, hence, the, we understand that the, there could be a number of different opportunities depending on um, how, how deep we want to get into uh, the options of, for recreation. Um, so that's why we'd like to have the study focus on the actual physical land there, that small parcel, very small parcel, but then also to focus on in the river. How, how can people get to the river? And those, I think, are going to present, we're, we're, we will be presented with multiple opportunities that we'll have to weigh feasibility, um, financially, um, ecologically. Yeah. Uh, Glenn. I just want to briefly say that I am not concerned about uh, potential downstream uh, effects of supporting this study at the moment. I think it's going to be great. Um, and I also want to uh, recommend that everyone take a look down in that direction whenever you have the opportunity. I walk over the Main Street Bridge uh, several times every day, and I have seen otters and mink and beavers, uh, both upstream and downstream of that spot, um, along with tons of waterfowl all the time. So it's already surprisingly rich, and I, I think it's going to be uh, really exciting to see the changes. Great. I think we should vote. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah, do you have oh, comments? Yes, of course. Well, 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, John Snell again. Um, we did talk extensively about this during the Taylor Street Committee days. And uh, one of the problems that I th am now seeing is that the Taylor Street building was designed by somebody and the shared pathway, if I may, was designed <laughs> by somebody else. And that shared pathway design was never really locked in because of the many uncertainties that there were. Uh, that we're moving closer to where that's exactly going to be and what it might look like. But to my knowledge, it's still not permanently designed. I think it and, is. Uh, I, yeah, it is. It's got an overview and... Well, from, let's say from, from the north branch, uh, from the north branch east, all right, towards, <laughs> that, that's a bit wishy-washy as far as I know. Uh, from from the north branch going toward Main Street over the bridge. Yeah, there's the, no I think that's all new bridge set. new bridge and then it's coming straight out to Main Street, right? I've seen the drawings um, it, What I'm concerned about is that there's all of a sudden a lot of parking in there <laughs> and I've communicated with Bill about this that doesn't fit very nicely with the Confluence Park, as far as I'm concerned. There's two-way streets in there where I'd love to see options for one-way streets. We, in fact, had a, a, I think, a fairly sophisticated design by the engineers for uh, access to the river the that would go the under side, right? the new yeah. pedestrian bridge and under the existing railroad bridge and would right. be fully handicap accessible, big enough that you could get a canoe carried down and put in the water into the north branch right at the confluence. That, that survived. Yeah. That design, it's I thought. Not, that's not in the no. design right now. Wow. And so those things were discussed and kind of lost in the mix. Well, there were yes. Army Corps issues too and water access issues. And I mean, it wasn't just a, let's put this in. <laughs> There's I want to certainly want yeah. you to be able to finish your thought yeah. there. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, and then the kayakers too. Mm -hmm. You know that I'd love to meld that back into the discussion. Yeah. Well, I certainly hope that uh, by the end of this, we have some options for access to the river, and whether it's on the Shaw's side or on the Confluence Park side of the river, that we you know figure something out. So, um, and and your points well taken. Uh, you know that the other side of the river ha is is a, a lot of parking, and let's you know that it, it that it is what it is for for now. Um, and you know let's keep let's keep talking about it. So, thank you. Parking for the park. Yeah. All right. I hope it's clear what my well, so in, in light of Donna's suggestion I'm here. I'm still confused about what we need as a motion. I would move that we move ahead with the design and plans, right? And the River do, Conservatory, right? I'm, they're doing the study on our behalf. Do we need to commit to anything? anything they're to gonna us? you're gonna provide Proof. us with some options, and we'll decide if we like them, right? Well, we have to direct the city staff to include Confluence Park website on and the website and then Donna suggested that we actually just create Confluence Park or yeah, something well, we, we've never s made an official motion to support Confluence Park existing right. so it seemed to me we'd need to make a motion that we want to have that as our vision right. and that will direct staff to have a placeholder in our website yeah okay so I would move then that we designate um, the portion on the map on Page. I think it's page 18 of the Capital District Master Plan. Uh, I would move that we designate that space. I believe it's marked as number, is it number five? Four. Four. I would move then that we designate that area marked as number four on page 18 of the Capital District Master Plan as Confluence Park. I would further uh, direct city staff to add that to our website as a coming attraction. <laughs> we, we have well done. I'll second it. Everybody can get behind. Do you have that? Do you have that image? 
I am looking Ashley, at it. Can you just uh, like just turn turn your laptop around just so we can see like to you or to Rose? I want to see because I I'm I see sure. what she's talking about. Although right this there. is oh yeah. you're talking about from the right. Yeah. Okay. This is called the capital yes. capital district, district master, master plan, plan. Yes. from 2000. Does that work? From for you, that sure. designation. Okay. Guys are stealing them. Okay. So there was a second. Make it work. Yes. I um, get it. It'll be what they designed. John Doyle. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Any further discussion? Great. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. So excited about this. Um, all right. Let's move on to talking about recommendations uh, regarding the Emerald Ash Borer. So, um, how should we start this? I Do guess I'll start, start? Okay. <laughs> before the before the ash borers all come out. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, the At the last meeting, we received a presentation from the tree board and folks about the ash borer and its status in the city and uh, requesting short and long-term funding. And it was left for the city manager to make a recommendation to the council for this meeting. Uh, so I did speak uh, a bit with Jeff and tried to get an understanding of the, the current status of ash borer versus, uh, you know, what what work is needed that's for that specifically versus what work is sort of backlog work that just, uh, you know, we're behind on and would need to get done in order to deal with the ash borer and that kind of thing. And so my recommendation was that, um, you know, I, I was reluctant and am reluctant to support a new position. We rarely, if ever, add new positions um, sort of out of budget and, and because we don't, you know, we just talked about uh, adding positions for, for this. We we know that there's uh, the police uh, want new people. We, you know, I think any department could come in at any time and make the case why they need a new person at this particular point in time. And so my view is that this is a very serious problem. We need to take it seriously. We've been put on notice for this. Um, so I don't mean to diminish it, but we need to weigh the priority for this along with all the other city priorities when, we, when we're setting our budget. So for this year that we're in, we did set a service level for trees and parks. And then I'd be the first to say it's probably understaffed. Um, but they're getting the work done that we set out to do with the resources that we allocated. Um, but we also had the foresight over the last two years to set 4,000 a year aside for the ash borer knowing it was coming. And, and as I, re which is nowhere near adequate, I, I get that. But there was a request to treat some trees, a request to cut some trees, and it seems to me that that could be done with that, <laughs> with that amount of funding, certainly with what was presented. Um, but it's hard to say we're gonna hire a new staff person that we might then be cutting in a couple of months when we do the budget. And so that is my position. It's not to say that it's not necessary. It's not to say that it's not uh, an important problem. Um, but I, I think we, we laid out our resources last year. The voters passed them. And um, so that's where I'm at. Obviously, I, I'm very clear that the, the tree board and the tree warden don't agree with me. And uh, that's why we're here having this conversation. Um, Rosie, and then I'm going to have some comments. Go sure. Ahead. Um, it, it occurs to me that um, tree removal is a pretty specialized skill, and I'm wondering if we can, at least in the interim, contract out for to, to deal with some of the backlog of tree removal um, to a private contractor, um, and um, that potentially that would get us into a, a better position for the spring um, to bring on a, a full-time staff member or you know whatever we decide to do in the budget process, but that might be a temporary solution that would move us forward um, using some of that $8,000. I know that won't go a long way towards, towards contracting out, but um, certainly we have companies that do this work um, and I would assume we already do that sometimes. Yeah, I wouldn't. I mean, they do contract, and I know it's pretty expensive per tree. I don't know how many trees you get done, depending on the type of work. Um, I mean, I wouldn't attempt to dictate how the 8,000 was used. I would assume they would use it um, as, as much as they can. But, um, so, I mean, I've said what I need to say. I don't want to, you know. 
Um, so I, I'm also hesitant to add a staff person midstream here. Um, I, it's certainly is something that I would be up for talking about, you know, in the context of our budget conversation. But again, in the context of um, all the other um, positions that we might be adding. Um, Having said that, uh, you know, if there is a way, uh, like I, I appreciate Rosie's comments about, you know, what can be done now. I mean, if this is something that we can contract out. Um, I, so one of the things that I'm not totally clear on is uh, if we were going to try to um, work on some of the backlog. <clears throat> just like how much that specifically would cost um, so that we can be <clears throat> better positioned um, to deal with it in um, the, the spring. Um, and then um, in the meanwhile, like, uh, you know, what needs to be done between now and the spring in terms of, um, you know, communicating with National Life or talking um, with um, neighboring, communities. neighboring communities or like spraying trees, like what what actually needs to be done like logistically like right now um, and and if we can take care of some of that backlog like how much is is that you know that we're talking about to, to contract that out um, yeah Jonathan Connor and, and, and you may want to go to them first but I guess I would like to frame the problem having lived here with the the big flood 1992 when we didn't have a clue how to really deal with it and we came out of that and started having plans, strategies. And so I see this bore, this little bore, as the leak in the dike. And if we got to do more than just put our thumb in it. And maybe it's not a staff person, but it's got to be some personnel that can really lead the way, because trees need to be constantly inventoried. And they have to be taken away and dealt with. And they've got some ideas, that they call it in their the packet they gave us. They call it, I think, a marshalling area. Jeff can correct me. But even just doing the marshalling area is a major capital expense. And you've got to go from the first tree you cut down that's infected, you've got to deal with it right away. And they have a way to peel it out, so then you take away the bore. And then you have some wood that you can use and then sell and make some revenue. But as soon as we have that first tree, we're behind the game. So I don't want to wait till we're flooding and have, you know, our boats are in the street. I want to do it now. And Anne, I know you supported it. That's why we got the 8,000 we got. We had to push really hard with the other council to just get 4,000 each year. And it is a very small thumb in the dike. And I know it's out of sequence. But even if you're not dealing with the backlog, just reading this plan as far as monitoring trees, and there's a state grant that's going to be out, and they say they're going to award it to that community that is the most innovative of how they're going to deal with the ash borer. Because from my reading, the states and feds haven't decided how to do it. And so w we could spend part of our personnel time that we'd be buying, not only inventorying the trees, but really working on a really clever, innovative way to make, as Jeff would say, lemonade out of this sour, sour lemon situation. And then get the, the support of the state grant, maximize our dollars, and save our trees. Public outreach is huge. We have a lot of trees in private property. National Life is huge. They haven't come to the table yet. So, Any Donna, this this is a, a grant through the state, is that right? Well, the state is, they'll tell you about it. The state, I believe, is setting up a grant. Okay. And we don't know what the deadline is for that? No, we don't. Okay, all right. No, but it's coming up because they're behind the eight ball, right, too. Right, sure. Yeah. So I, okay. I don't want us to take the back seat. I'm sorry. I want us to just really push out and look to where we could find some money for staff because I also know when you hire a contractor for a tree, I mean, Jeff will have the numbers. You're talking five, six times mm -hmm. right, what we pay our staff. So right. I just really want us to take this serious. I don't want to have a flood of dying trees. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Connor, did you? Yeah, now just a rookie question. Say we go through the budget process, uh, we approve a position. What's realistically, what's the earliest possible? This position is on the ground. We could move it, you know. I mean, we, once town meeting approves the vote, I mean, technically the budget doesn't take place till July 1, but we can usually move stuff quicker. You know, we could start moving after that, after town meeting time. Okay, thanks. 
Ashley. So I would echo a lot of what Donna said. I think these are the very things that city government is supposed to be focusing on. Um, and and I, I totally appreciate that we need lots of city staff, um, which is you know, sort of one of the reasons that I was a bit reticent, quite reticent, about expending more city staff resources on, on putting together these parking garage contracts because I, I know that all of our city departments are already sort of tapped out as it is. Um, I just, I'm wondering, I mean, to me, this is the kind of thing where I think we have the capacity to be innovative in these solutions. Um, and, and I think it would make sense to, to bring someone in, I know $8,000 I don't think is nearly enough to do this, but to bring somebody in to, or, or maybe to have the, the tree board identify, like what are the most critical things that we can get done? What do we need to get that done? Um, and, and I would support and ask to, to come out of some other fund to do, to do that work because I think that we have a committed group of folks here who I get lots of emails and volunteer opportunities and I'm gonna make it to one. I'm just terrified of ticks because I have Lyme disease. Um, so I, I, I think this is the kind of thing that city government should be supporting and should really be finding ways to, to make this work. Um, and I, and I, I don't see a way around adding a position if we're already hearing from, you know, from parks that we can't even keep up with what we need to be keeping up with and now we're adding more to that um, with a new park and, and all these other new things that are really exciting and happening here. Um, I, I think I would push pretty hard to, to find the funds. If we can identify sort of the most critical if we if if we can't get a staff person right now, if you could give us like your top five things and come back to us as soon as as soon as you possibly can, which I feel bad even asking because you do all of the things. Um, if you could get us that list, I would be more than willing to to sort of make that push to get those funds because I I think this is the very thing that we are here to do. Sure. Yeah, come up and introduce yourself. And I don't think I need a microphone. Yes, you do. Well, you do for the people at home. being recorded. Yes, you do. Please. All right. And what's your name? It's my understanding. And would you tell us your name first? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Wanda Burrill, and I think some of you know about me already. Thank you. I got an award a while ago. And... um. I, it's my understanding that, a, that there is another group of individuals working on this problem. And I've given them some information tonight to contact this group, which is called the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. And they meet, I think, every other week, um, not week, but m every other month. And they would like to invite us to maybe go to one of their meetings and to talk with them about our issues and see what they're trying to do. Because they are meeting and talking about this very same thing. So um, I'm not in any position to lead the troops. <laughs> But I think I could set up a meeting for somebody, maybe you two, to go and talk with them and find out, okay, what are they doing? If it's money they need, then are they getting money? Where is it coming from? You know, there's a lot of questions there, I think, that haven't been answered yet. And we might be able to, uh, kind of come back with a report saying, well, this group is doing this, and maybe that would solve some of the problem. I'm not sure. Sure. So maybe we can have uh, you coordinate with, uh, with the Center for Vermont Regional Planning Commission and... Uh, and their office is upstairs over Rite Aid, so you can walk to it from here. <laughs> Very convenient. Yes. We're, Thank we're you. Member. And we have a rep a on, on that board, so we, we, can, I, we can certainly I, facilitate. Okay, we, can figure that. We're, we have a member on that board. Okay, so I would get him to, or her, to connect with you yeah. and see if we can't move forward with that. That's a great idea. Thank you. And by the way, I'm living in Montpelier now. Okay. Well, you're I not in Berlin anymore. Well, <laughs> um, Glenn and, the, oh, and, and, and Rosie, Rosie. And then I would love to invite um, 
tree board, John, Jeff, to come back up and, and chat. Other John. <laughs> Rosie first, oh. I think. <laughs> oh, whatever. Um, so I was, I confess, when I was thinking about budgeting process, I was thinking November. I was forgetting the fact that yeah. then we go, you know, the whole timeline. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I would like to have more of a holistic conversation about how this fits into our budget in November. Um, but I want to be ready to move forward at that point before um, hanging around, waiting around for the new budget year. Um, so. I don't know how best to work that. Um, but just timeline. Are you thinking of like trying to separate out some things for now and other things for that conversation, or um, just leaving it leaving it all till the, the conversation in November? I mean, I. I I really like us being able to sit down and figure out, okay, staff positions, what are our priorities, and, and have that whole conversation together. But I am realizing that that means putting this off much further than I was thinking. Um, and this is urgent. Um, and if we're really, you know, if we're not able to get a new person on until late in the spring, even if we jump the gun a little bit, um, that worries me. So I, I don't know what, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Uh, Glenn. Um, I don't want to be reckless with this, but I, I think I'm in favor of adding staff now. Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, everything, including, for example, making a list of the priorities and so on, depends on more staff hours, and there are not staff hours now. Um, the, the letter that we got from John Snell earlier this week, and also the recent letter, I think, from uh, Dan Dickerson, um, use words like exponential. Uh, and to me, that means uh, the same kind of thing as a stitch in time saves nine. If we do it now, then we will have less to do later. Uh, and I think that that is a, a, an accurate description of this problem, as I see it. So um, Donna's finger in the dike uh, analogy is, is the same to me. If you don't, you know, that dike will continue cracking you're going to need a lot more fingers. So I would, I would be in favor of more staff now. John, you want to come share any thoughts? Or, or Jeff, whoever? Jeff, you can sit at the table. Um, thank you. And, and I'm glad I'm out here instead of sitting in chairs. <laughs> I got to tell you, you know, it's hard enough dealing with the darn ash bore, but to deal with the issues you are is even probably more problematic. Um, so uh, I just drove back from Michigan and I got to see what this thing looks like. And it's horrendous. And if we don't hop on it and deal with it right now, uh, according to the plan that John drew up, that's a brilliant plan, by the way, and and a lot of the other uh, uh, towns in central Vermont and elsewhere are are stealing our plan and using it. It's that good. Um, then we're going to see results like I saw on the way home, which is literally I passed tens of thousands of trees along the roadsides that were dead. Many of them were so dead they were coming down, including into the interstate highway in some cases. Um, I saw other places where it had just started. Uh, I did a lot of investigation, and it's very clear that that's what's ahead of us. And I hadn't seen it with quite such shocking results as, as the, I saw in the last couple of weeks. Um, I appreciate being able to send that note to you. It was a little awkward to do that, and thank you for just accepting it. Uh, uh, clearly, one of the big issues is that the parks people are essential to making this happen. And I wouldn't say that Jeff's been lying to you over the past couple of years, but we all know Jeff is enthusiastic. Where is he? Behind me. Right back there. <laughs> He's an enthusiastic guy who always emphasized the positivity in things. And Honestly, I think that, you know, when I look at what's available to us as a tree board from parks resources, I'm counting one person and maybe another quarter person. It's not two people anymore. 
and it's some volunteers that you know we can roust up but it's not what we need to deal with this problem the eight thousand bucks is a wonderful offer um, I would point out that when we came to you in 2013, we suggested setting aside $20,000 a year, in which case we'd be looking at a hundred grand, and that would be a whole different kettle of fish. But um, I think that given the limitations of parks right now, uh, and I, I, I'm not privy to all of it, um, so if I'm wrong, forgive me, but that it's just not, we don't have the availability of what we need. And what we need is somebody that come early March, late February, is able to just go right in and do the work that needs to be done. We're not treating trees now. We're gonna have to wait until spring to do that, so we can't spend the $8,000 on treatment of downtown trees now. Um, to hire an outside ar arborist to come in and cut, I think, you know, sometimes you have to do it. There's a couple trees now that I think are beyond the capabilities of parks, as good as they are. And, and that's where you do hire somebody that has bigger equipment and more experience. But the $8,000 would go like that to bring it in. It's just not sufficient to what we need. To do work now is what we're aiming for is to get caught up on some of the dangerous tree work, the hazard tree work, so that come spring, parks people are available to work on the ash borer. And I'm going to let John uh, talk about some of what those needs will be in the spring, but they're, they're you know, they're, they're going to require somebody who knows what they're doing. And I see that person coming on now or very soon and being fully trained and capable by spring to be able to just go for it. Can the, I ask you a question? Sorry yep. to interrupt. Um, do you have a sense, or, or Jeff, do you have a sense of how much it would cost to contract out the, um, the backlog? I would guess about twice as much as if we did it ourselves. Oof. So uh, there's a couple types of bike backlogs, and one is hazardous trees, and we're close to catching up to the hazardous trees identified in the inventory about four years ago. Uh, but the other thing that we're behind on, and uh, it, it, and it could be neglected uh, further, it's been neglected for a lot of years, but the, the longer you neglect pruning trees and doing the prophylactic care, the more expense you have in the back end. Um, you have bad forks that get older and, and split, and then at a certain point they can't be, uh, they can't be pruned, uh, pruned out of it. And we've been wanting to get to a neighborhood by neighborhood pruning program to, to prevent uh, a number of those kinds of problems. And we haven't been doing that because we've been working on hazard trees. So, um, uh, and, and the other thing to put into the mix is if, if we wait too long uh, so that we're in a, in, a, in a busy time, then we have to hire someone with skills. We can't start them and, and train someone at a, at, at a lower rate, which is what we'd like to do is start someone part-time, get them trained, and then be ready for to jump into action next year when things heat up. But you, you don't have a number for, for uh, if we contracted for, it out just right now? Uh, I don't think I could give you okay, a responsible number now, but sure. I could get that to you okay. in, in the next meeting. But that would be the, helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, probably probably twenty thousand dollars would be my Ballpark. rough guess, but I'll give you uh, okay. I'll give you something more accurate. Great, thank you. Before Jeff uh, disappears, yeah, Donna, w would yeah. you explain? Because when I was at the uh, Parks Commission last evening and heard you talk about what percentage of the park staff applies to trees, it's like the staff is split between the tree board and the Parks right. Commission. Is that right one now, fifth? It's uh, no, well. It's, it's uh, Alc and I each doing one day a week, so it's two fifths. Uh, for trees, yeah. Two fifths. Yeah. For trees. For, for the year, we have two fifths of a position to take care of. Trees. Two and a half thousand, three thousand. Well, if you include the, the the bike path and the public lands, it's probably three thousand street trees. Yeah. Thank you. And I know John, we had interrupted you, so if you want to <laughs> jump back in, we'll, we'll share it. Yeah. Um, the the thing that's really crucial in this is the, the idea of exponential and it, that that it's not just a linear thing that's going to get worse and worse and worse it's going to explode in the spring 
the small infestation that we saw of probably uh, less than a dozen trees up at National Life. And by the way, those have now been ground up and burned in their, in their boiler. Um, that's going to explode. That dozen trees could easily end up being a hundred or more trees next year. It could jump from there to four or five other locations. So you don't know how bad it's going to be. Here's my question. You know that it's going to be exponential. So what's going to happen? And I, I hear that, and I heard that before, and I get it, and I factored that into my thinking. But what's going to happen between now and then that's going to prevent that? If, what's, our, what's our new person going to do between now and then to stop that from happening between now and spring? Thank you. Uh, we're going uh, we're gonna to take steps to understand where the spread happens. So, so we'll, we'll be setting out traps that will allow us to identify if there's, in various areas around the city, if there are insects, are they there? We'll be able to do more branch sampling, which requires the bucket trap going up in the tree and actually sampling branches of suspect trees. Um, there'd be a number of steps, but the idea is that if we know where it is, then we can get these trees when they're first infected, uh, uh, excuse me, infested. Um, and if we don't, then, then it becomes a much more costly issue uh, because the tree becomes brittle and is more costly to take down. Kit. I have a um, question. So, uh, yeah, Jack and then Rosie and then back to Donna. It seems to me that the only real concrete proposal we have before us tonight is the manager's proposal to authorize the expenditure of this $8,000. And I <clears throat> would like to invite you, working with Jeff or whoever, to come back with a real uh, fleshed out proposal for how many staff, what staff, and what they would do um, before we're into the, uh, before it just goes on the city budget in on town meeting day. Um, a question I have is, with regard to the manager's proposal now, if we do what he recommends and authorize the use of this $8,000, could that be used uh, usefully be t before some uh, more comprehensive plan is uh, is adopted uh, uh, from my point of view and I'll let these two other guys talk to that as well the thing that's needed right now is to hire somebody that that's not going to be a full-fledged licensed arborist that we can train up on safety chainsaw uh, uh, all the EAB stuff and have them ready to go in the spring uh, in the meantime, there's a lot of inventory work that can be done. Uh, I, just for Yahoo's added up my hours, I'm pretty rigorous about keeping track of that. And since the first of the year, I put 250 hours into this tree board. And I'm yeah. gonna be 70 years old in a month, and I can't <laughs> keep it up. And it's exponential, you know? Oh, I can't guy. do 2,000 hours next year. I can't. Can you inventory in the winter? Yes. Absolutely. So you can still be assessing where it's yeah. at. We, we've inventoried, you know, all, all that we have. Um, uh, chances are good that it's not going to spread a lot over the winter that we'll see. But there are things that we can do over the winter. So would it make sense to use this $8,000 not for treatment and or removal of ash trees, but to begin with uh, inventory and potential staff training? To, to get somebody on board and get them trained up. I yes. see. I think that's what makes the most sense. But I'll let these guys talk. Yeah, I can give you a little bit more of a picture of what I have, um, but um, I could get you even more detail. So what I have in mind is that they would do the inventory. And, and a matter of fact, in uh, in October is the best time to do branch sampling. Uh, right now we've, we've tried to do it, but the the larvae is in the tree and it's wor trees and working around and, and the research from other states that have done this has have shown that late September, early October, you go to the distressed trees and you, you take branches and you look for the galleries underneath and that gives you an idea where it is. So then you can act on that over the winter or you know where to marshal your, your resources in the next spring. 
So that would be that would be a key thing. And the other thing I, I would want to do with that person is get them in the neighborhood uh, program, starting to prune some trees and get that experience uh, in the bucket truck on the ground um, and, and get going with that. So it would be a two pronged. Uh, so I, I hate to be a little, um, you know, dollars and cents-ish about this, but uh, th there's part of me that's dubious that hiring somebody now and paying them through till, you know, m March of next year would end up being cheaper than just paying someone who was a professional arborist in March. Well, uh, we wouldn't have the capacity to do the branch sampling in October and have a picture and a, and a plan uh, by then. Um, that, that would limit that. And we wouldn't be able to do the neighborhood pruning program uh, until March uh, either. Um, so we, we, could, we could jump into action uh, with a professional in spring, uh, but we wouldn't have taken care of any of the backlog. Yep. Um, so we would need so we need to pay the higher paid person. That's, yeah. the, that's the dilemma. Right. Uh, Rosie. So I'm just trying to think of all our potential options here. And so I was interested to hear that um, you and Alec are each spending one day a week on trees. And I'm wondering if we could use some of our money instead to contract out some of your other responsibilities to free up more of your time, you know, as you're already trained and presumably able to do all this, um, that maybe that would be a way of, in the interim, dedicating more time to it, and then we can have the conversation about whether we need an additional position, which we likely will, but then we can find the money in a, a more comprehensive Yeah, or if I can way. jump back in, maybe even finding things that, that are occupying Jeff's time now or Alex's time that could be done either by DPW or recreation. I, I don't know. Sure. It's all part, of, good part of the conversation. John Akulashik, uh, I had an idea. I'm not sure it will fly here. <laughs> uh, I worked for the state for over 30 years, and as new administrations came in, they often uh, gave us new jobs to do. And when you're faced with new tasks, you have an option. One is to stop doing something that you're doing. That never happens. Uh, option two was basically to uh, take personnel from another area and at least assign them temporarily to help you accomplish the goal. So it's called, you know, uh, other duties as assigned is how, how they put it. And that gets you over the hump of the, of the work. And again, I don't know if that would fly here, but instead of putting out the money to hire another person, which is what they really need, if you could transfer possibly transfer a willing and able person from DPW into Jeff's group to work on this problem probably for quite a few years here. That's just a thought. That seems interesting to me. Of course, we need to have lots of conversation about that. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah, or pick up some other slack from you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So, oh, Just yeah. I wanted to get back to your your thought sure. of, of paying somebody over yeah, the winter. Yeah. The, I don't know what the cost difference is going to be, but I'm 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 envisioning that the kind of person we have in mind hiring now or soon and training up so that they're fully ready in the spring, compared to a, 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 a you know a, a fully qualified arborist, you're talking about two or three to one price difference. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can invest in somebody and really have that pay off for a long time yeah. to hire an arborist in the spring if one's available because these guys are all flat out busy already dealing with this insect. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just don't see it as a viable option. So um, at this point, uh, team, what is your pleasure? What do you want to do? Well, I'd like to hear Bill's reaction to some of the ideas about shifting other personnel or shifting responsibilities of tree staff in the short term. Um, I think those are all fine ideas, and we'd have to we'd have to talk about them. I mean, I think what we'll find is the, the situation that is being described in this department isn't that different across the board. DPW is, you know, way over 
booked right now, and they're they're running at max. And so, you know, are they, who are they going to give up? But you know, we can certainly have that conversation and talk about it and see whether you know it might even be that we could find someone for a short period of time until until we do budget. You know, again, I'm not. I, I want to reiterate. I'm not saying sympathetic. I'm not unsympathetic to the situation that they need more staff, but. There will be, you know, we're going to have some number when we do our budget, some limit. <laughs> Maybe a different limit than it's been the last few years, but there's going to be a limit. And we're going to want to include this position and these kind of things. We're going to want to include, I suspect, a lot more money for the Housing Trust Fund. We're going to want to include positions for MEAC and energy and facilities. We're going to want to include an additional police person. We have a long list of people. You know, some of those will make it and some of them won't. And I don't know right now which ones I would recommend because I haven't seen the whole and we haven't had that conversation. So, you know, hiring a person now that may, you know, either we've, we've prejudged our priorities without giving other folks a chance to make their case or we're putting someone in a position to get laid off. Uh, and and, and not to, I think, you know, if you want to identify a sum of money and, you know, I, no question you can, you'll get more done with your own employee than with a contract, but you can get some done. And maybe there's, you know, whether it's trees being cut or I don't know if people can be hired on contract basis. I, I, my reluctance isn't against getting the work done. My reluctance is against making a commitment to a person that we hire and provide benefits and now as a job that we may or may not be able to make that commitment to them over the long run once we set our full priorities. If there's an interim need while well, that's being discussed and, you know, 8,000, know, Jeff said 20, maybe we could allocate 12 and we could figure out where we could get that from. And, and do something like that, I think then you're, but I don't want to just say we gave them money if it's not useful to them either. So, I mean, that's where I'm stuck is that, you know, there's, you know, I, I don't mean to, to be hysterical, but we could bring Tony in and he could talk about opiates and how the way they've been running short of a police officer for a year. And, yeah. you know, he could, I'm sure we have an immediate need for another police officer. So. And, on and on. So at, at this point, I would, I would love um, to just, I guess, in, invite you all, if you were able to, to uh, you know, come back with a more concrete number about um, if we were going to contract out the, you know, take care of the Something. backlog. Um, you know, I guess I would invite knowing what that is and then having a conversation about that in the meanwhile so that at least in that, in that way we can be more ready. Um, that's just information, so you know that's, that's hopefully an easy thing to ask for. But um, yeah, Jack. I'm especially interested in uh, here seeing a number for bringing someone in, not to hire someone as a permanent employee to start training them to fill this job, but what it would cost to hire a temporary employee to come in and do the inventory in October, which is seems like that's a critical time. And that gives us a, a database for the rest of the budget season and for what the work is going to be needed for next year. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And then, Sorry, Connor? Um, yeah, there's a little confusion here. We did the inventory. The volunteers did the inventory. We spent a couple hundred hours probably walking the street. So the inventory is done. He's talking about the branch sampling. Branch sampling. The branch sampling is a different matter. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm talking so, about. So, Basically, we, I heard the phrase earlier, the status of the ash borer. The status of the ash borer is unknown at this time. We know that we had an infestation at National Life, and bugs have left there. That's all we know. Next spring, we will know exactly how bad it is. John indicated that it could be hundreds of trees. We don't know right now. So the branch sampling was done on trees that we identified this year as being suspect trees. You're not just going to go out and do a lot of branch sampling on other trees. That's just not going to happen because there's 450 of them out there on the street alone to look for this bug. What you need to do is you need to set up a system in the spring and somebody to run the system where you're monitoring with green traps, which are these sticky traps. You've seen the purple ones probably. These are green ones now that have a pheromone 
that attract the males, and you set them up in areas that you have suspected infestation. You'll know about these suspected infestation in the spring when the leaves come out because a lot of your trees will have missing leaves in the canopy. That's where you set up your traps. That's also where you start talking about where you're gonna set up your trap trees to remove some of the bugs. It's also gonna be where you decide which trees need to come out now because they're infested and they need to be removed from the population before the adults emerge in May and June. Because if they get out, you've got a bigger problem, right? So it is exponential in that you have to be able to identify those trees in the spring. You need someone that's geared towards being able to do that making the decisions to say, we need to cut this tree, this tree, this tree, get them to the marshalling area, which was mentioned earlier, because you don't want to leave those trees where they are. The bugs will continue to, to grow and emerge. Get them to the marshalling area, process them, sawmill, chipper, whatever, remove those guys from the population. That's how you slow the spread of this critter. If you don't do these things, if you don't have somebody on top of this, the critter gets the upper hand, and you're behind the eight ball, and that's, that's going to be all. I can, that's just the pattern. It's been done before in the country. We know it. We don't need to fall into the same mistakes. That's all. And the adults emerge in May, so we need to have someone. That's why we need to remove the trees before that. Before May. Chip them, get that outer bark done, yeah. processed, destroyed, yeah. burn it up. Process the rest of the wood as firewood, give it to the low-income folks if they need it, whatever. There's all sorts of stuff you can do with the yeah. wood. But unless you start acting on these ideas... Is this something that can be shared with neighboring communities? Is this something that can be done regionally? The marshalling area? Well, or the person staff. We don't even have a marshalling area right now. No, no, the staffing, the, the person... Staffing. Just, just, We're going to have a full... <laughs> there's going to be full-time need in this, this position here for this person to keep track of the 450 trees that are out on the streets, plus the 170 or so that are along the trails in Hubbard Park, plus the fact that North Branch Park hasn't been inventoried, Blanchard Park hasn't been inventoried. Right. You don't know the, ex there's more trees out there that haven't even been looked at. You need somebody to take charge and do that. And they have to be, they have to be on staff, they have to be trained, they have to be able to do that. That's, that's this my two cents. Uh, yeah, Connor, go ahead. So I, I, I really appreciate what Bill's saying about some difficult decisions ahead. Um, at the same time, this body has spent hours and hours on this issue. So almost by default, I think we've identified it as a priority. Um, you know, I, I'm convinced it's a real and immediate threat. Um, I have a tough time looking at these guys who have spent so many hours in a volunteer capacity. They're almost employees as it is, <laughs> not giving them more resources. So I think I'm with Jack. I'd like to see some more numbers at the next meeting to see some options that we could, we could review there. I'm, I'm not ready to shut the door on a position. It's also, I mean, just thinking out loud here, but I wonder if this kind of a service is... Um, something that could even be put out to bid to arborists, like if we can hire someone on a contract to do this for us for the year or two, well, however yeah. many. Anyway, we I'm just thinking on that. Yeah. Um, okay, so for now. We squeeze them into the next agenda? Yeah, I, th I think it's so. It's a straight, straightforward sort of report of this kind of detail of task yeah. and cost and Let's keep, uh, Rosie? It's actually just scheduling wise, uh, well, I have some thoughts about the next agenda. <laughs> Maybe okay. Not, this is not yep. the right time to. No, fair enough. Um, speaking of the agenda, actually, I mean, if we're, uh, well, are we, does anybody want to make a motion or do you, or should we just move on for now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so looking forward to more numbers. Um, and uh, about the, the next um, item, so theoretically we would be taking up um, the parklets at this point, but it is 10.15, and I would love to push, I don't think that's an urgent issue, so if we can um, make ne the 12th the first reading and then push the second reading to September 26th, that I think would be useful. Um, yes, Rosie? I was going to even suggest pushing it further because this is something... I mean, we need to know this winter what we're doing, but 
Yeah. We could figure 26, it out in October. 26th for first, yeah. Yeah, 26th and October 10th. I, I think that, you mean for the parklet? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. And then, and then um, uh, the ash borers can take the place of the parklet on the, um, on the 12th. Isn't it great that we have that here? Yeah, so happy. Very good. That is actually incredibly That's great. helpful. Thank right? you, Mayor. <laughs> but there's so, a, so there's I'm a, sorry, where are you moving parklets? Here. Yeah, we're going to move parklets to the 26th and then the 10th. Um, or the second? There are, there's a fancy box of markers. Yeah, these are the markers. Oh, oh wow. Do you want to, do you want to, oh. why don't you move to October 10th? Is that a, what is that a dry erase marker? Is that a dry erase marker? You should no, you got to use it. You got to use. We're almost going to talk about the ash borer for. Boy, you almost did it. Woo, Jack. <laughs> Close call. Well, you, I you told can you even you. erase the permanent ones. But, yeah. So I. You're gonna get. You're gonna be messing with Jamie here. So. <laughs> Just, just so you know. Let the record reflect it was Jack <laughs> that almost wrote <laughs> permanent marker. And October second. So no, that's no, that's the now the, the third, this. by the way. Oh yeah. It's October. But, but October 10th would be the... September 26th and then October 10th. Okay. The October 3rd is a special meeting. <laughs> we'll make the we'll handwriting all consistent later. Yeah, well, <laughs> right. Great. Well, Jamie will. She's... And then we can... Great. Thank you. Awesome. That's really great. That's all right. Good. So um, kicking the parklet um, for now. Um, I think the only thing left to do is the point the VLCT voting rep. Um, are you all aware of what the VLCT is? Yes. Well, I feel like we should probably do like sure. 20 seconds on okay. that. Vermont League of Cities and Towns is the member association of all the municipalities in the state. It does, it provides insurances, uh, legal advice, technical advice on all sorts of issues. Um, but one of the other things is also represents towns and cities at the legislature and they adopt a municipal policy each year. Um, full disclosure, I'm a member of the board of directors of the league, uh, so just you know. And, uh, and I was chair of one of the policy committees, the water resources committee this year. Um, and the so the membership votes to adopt this policy then, just not unlike what we do here, and then the, the staff represents that interest at the legislature. So each community is given one official voting rep. Anyone can attend, but only one, you know, you have the card that you raise, and um, the city council designates that voting rep. It's great if it's a council member, has been on several occasions in the past. I will be there, although it is on October 3rd. That's why I wasn't gonna be at the night meeting, because it's a two-day event, and I was gonna stay over with, because the league board is a, a thing at night. But be that as it may, so I can do it, and I have done it, so you're covered, but if one of you would like to do it, it's an interesting thing. And then there's training sessions the next day. Um, so if I've done it. It's pretty fun. Yeah, I would like great. to do it. It's great. So it is a daytime thing. And I'm curious, how, uh, how do we as a city council decide what positions to take on the uh, platform proposals? As I assume that we don't just pick someone and say, go do whatever you want. I distributed what they sent me to everybody. Nobody sent me any comments. I was right. the voter. But I think we sent it to everybody. To do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did but we it, send I've out? Gone every year but it's, one. It's so attached on the to yeah. the so agenda the, the, item. So the draft yeah. policy is there. So in year, we've done it a million different ways. We have, in fact, sent people with a do what you think is right. Uh, <laughs> we have some years said go and support the league policy as drafted. Other years, we've actually had it on the agenda and gone through it and taken, in, you know, not, not, not starting every line, but if there were issues that people said, no, we want it, you know, we direct our staff to ask, seek an amendment. There is a process where towns and cities can send in proposed amendments and those get voted on. Um, and it's clear that some select boards do go through them with fine tooth comb. So you can do it however you want. Um, you have till. October. You can go and not be the rep. Yeah, you can go and not be the rep and discuss. You just can't vote. Right. Uh, there, yeah, I've even just gone to the to the conference. The, and right. That's valuable as well. And that's so. changed. Though. The, one thing that's different okay. this year is that the Wednesday, the 3rd, is the voting day. Right. And there's just a couple of things there. And then there's, like, board stuff and a dinner and stuff at night. And then the next day is the sort of the conference thing. Board they used shops. to cram them all together. So if you go on the third, that's great, but you don't 
go on the fourth. And the city, of course, covers the registration cost and costs for anybody who wants to go, including staying over if you want to. Where is it this year? I want South to say South Burlington, Burlington at the. Is it because yeah. it alternates? It yeah. was down in Rutland. Is it the Double Tree Hilton, which used to be the Sheraton? Right. So the I one out by the interstate. I yeah. believe that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah it's got it right here, so it's okay. it's really there's so many good workshops and yep. good discussions. It's really worth. It really looks so very interesting. Just the one yeah. day is really I've heard cool. that Ashley wants to be the voting rep. Does anybody else have any interest in being the voting rep? I'll be gone. So I'm not going to fight you for it. <laughs> no. No. No one else. Okay. I think we do need to vote on that. I, yeah. I have a little bit, but I'm not going to get in your way, so do it. Oh. Totally do it. <laughs> By all means, I do have I do have a request, though. There are some things in here that I find particularly problematic surrounding mental health, uh, substance use, and abuse, uh, and Department of Corrections that I would I would like to raise with the council. So I'm wondering if we could just put it on an, on the agenda, not necessarily go through it line by line, but if people could just raise their issues with it, because um, there were some things that kind of really stood out to me, and and a couple of things that have come up that I've been following over the years. It's a fairly conservative group. Um, Can I just say, I got in a fight with the, uh, the ED at the time a few years ago because they were against the equal pay bill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Who better to go? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I nominate Ashley Hill to be the voting representative for the city of Montpelier to this year's VLCT uh, convention. Second. For the discussion? Vote your conscience. <laughs> All in favor, please it's never say a aye. problem. Aye. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, if um, I um, Honest, what is this happening? It's in October. October third. It's, October 3rd. 3rd. it's uh, Wednesday it's and the, Thursday. That's you why. Want to put something on the. The third is now the date of our special election. Oh, that's right. And that's honestly, I, I guess it's just more of the kind of thing. Next one. If no, there's. I mean, 26 to talk about it. Oh, right. Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah. Sure. I just, it doesn't need to be like anything in depth. Like, I just, I, I have some things that I would like to. Yeah. We can stick it on we the can end. Find out yeah. if everyone's yeah, on board. Yeah. Right. Sure. Okay, great. Um, thank you for doing that. Um, all right. So I think we are up to. We'll, we'll take care of it. Okay. Uh, council reports. Um, Rosie, would you like oh, to start? Yep. Yeah. Um, so I was approached by um, Dan Jones of the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition about being part of a group that they are putting together um, of landowners around the rivers in downtown to start to talk about what are some things that um, they can do to work together or kind of having a more of a at least talking to your neighbor, uh, understanding of, of what other people are doing so that might influence your own decision. Um, and uh, so I was approached about kind of attending some of those meetings. And I'm interested, um, but I also wanted to come back to the council and see if this is something that you would like me to attend as a council representative or with just kind of a private citizen hat on. Um, and I want to be really clear in understanding you know Your role. what my role is yeah um are you interested in i mean as a baseline you're interested in participating in some way or no yes so my understanding is it's a few meetings in september generally i'm really conservative about my ability to commit to stuff outside of uh, work and family in this um but i think that i can make the time to to attend of several meetings um so and it's a topic i'm really interested in and i think that one of my skills is sort of thinking about all this, you know, how do things um, interact with each other, and it, it, it interests me. So um, I would be happy to do it, but I also, if someone else is really interested, I wanted to give other folks the opportunity as well. I think you should go and say that you're representing the council. Okay. Agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that great? Great. I, all right. I was going to say, if you would prefer to represent yourself, if that's somehow easier, then... That's fine with me, too, but I, yeah. I might have been well, effectively I, outvoted I mean, just I now. trust your judgment. Well, yeah, I think we all said do. I mean, I think yes. it's the same thing, is that we're comfortable either way. But okay. sometimes if you have your personal hat on, it can be very useful insight. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I, you know, I won't make any commitments on the part of the city, but I just want to have a better sense of whether I'm, who I'm representing. So th that's helpful. But I'd love to hear a report about it. Sure, that. of course. Cool. Thank Great. you, Rosie. The only thing I have to say, in case that she's not uh, doesn't want to put herself forward too much, I want to uh, recommend my friend and seatmate Ashley's uh, 
op-ed piece in the Times Argus today on domestic violence. I thought it was great. Anyone out there who hasn't read it should. Thanks, Jack. Um, I want to thank everybody who came out to vote uh, in our election. I saw the email come out from John Odom that we needed more people because we had so many folks show up to vote. Um, and that's how democracy works. So I, I appreciate everyone's efforts in making that happen. Um, and I particularly really appreciate city staff and all of their efforts to to make it go as smoothly as possible. And those lines were impressive. Yes. It was great. Yes, it was really impressive. good to see. Uh, Donna. Oh, you start over here? Sure. Oh, well, I was, I was going to hunt for the, the one of the groups that I've just joined on my own is the Water Basin, a Clean Water Act, and we're dealing with the whole Winooski area. Berlin Pond is in there under some very interesting ways and already has some red marks about vulnerability and risk. This is good. But the Department of DEC, Department of Employment? Environmental, Environmental Conservation. Conservation. There you go. Uh, the water people. Uh, they have actually decided that they should start identifying pristine water areas, whether it's a pond, a river, and label them and protect them. What? Wow. Now, they didn't do that for Berlin Pond, but it doesn't mean we can't keep nurturing and get it Berlin Pond up there. It's an incredible table of just how much trouble we're having, not just with runoff from farmers, but things are showing up in the water, antibodies. I mean, it's just amazing. In the water, in the sampling of the soil around the water, and it, it's very, very interesting. And the report is like, yay, but I could email. And the drafts keep changing, but uh, it's really been very interesting. The other thing, it just I mentioned it before, but I will be gone. I leave the day after, I'm sure, our late 26th council meeting. I live on, leave on the 27th for Sweden, and I come back on the 9th, the day before. So I hope I'm not late flying in. Have a good time on the 3rd. <laughs> Uh, it may seem silly, but you know, I, I just really want to thank Sue and Bill and everybody who was involved in that uh, goat story. It's yeah. you, you know, if you think about the th thousands and thousands of dollars people would pump into like marketing to get such exposure <laughs> for like a city our size. I've had countless people from yeah. all over the country, even in Ireland, reach out and say, what a fantastic like city that is to live in. So uh, <laughs> I say it with all sincerity, like, great job on that one. <laughs> and the names, what could be better? Uh, <laughs> Ruth Bader and Ginsburg? They're not eating enough. They're not eating enough? They're not yeah, eating well, enough that's, of it. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. We may have to stop, because they're not actually We just legalized the substance, it might help them, right? <laughs> Get more goats. No. Um, as usual, join me tomorrow morning, Thursday, at Baguito's, 8.30 to 9.30, to talk about whatever you like. Uh, it's been going really well, and I continue to enjoy it. And I want to tell a very brief story about a whiteboard. Here in Montpelier, early when I was here, I signed up to be a, a substitute teacher at the high school. And the first day I walked into the classroom, it was empty. I took a marker and wrote Mr. Hutchison on the smart whiteboard, and then looked at the marker. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, after that boneheaded move, uh, I was really proud of myself that I thought hard and looked around the room and found the alcohol-based hand sanitizer. All right. <laughs> and nice work. wiped it right off. <laughs> so no one knew until right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in light of that, it just might be wise for us to maybe take that down. So it's not necessarily here in the uh, in the so, off season. I mean, we have hand sanitizer somewhere. <laughs> it's okay. Maybe so we just eliminate the permanent. The board? Can we, we just eliminate the permanent marker, or just turn it around, or do you know what I mean? Like, are you afraid we'll get extra comments? Yeah, maybe. Right. right? Well, then we won't necessarily have to leave the. Or well, any of the markers. Any other markers, you know, around. Yeah, okay, I'll talk we to you. We should just, yeah, we'll we should figure that figure out. Something. Put it in my office. Put it on the city's webpage. Yeah. yeah. Put a picture of it on the city's webpage and take it out of the room yeah. between meetings. Oh, it could be a Facebook post every day. That would be a yeah. great Facebook post. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, team, I have a few updates, um, so bear with me. Um, first of all, uh, 
yesterday I got to hang out with the Trash Tramps, um, yes. and that was just delightful fun. I would encourage you all to, if you can, uh, find a Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock to meet up with the Trash Tramps at the um, Senior Center, and then they walk around town picking up garbage, and it was a great time. So uh, shout out to them. Um, that's thing number one. Thing number two, um, I just want to relay that I... Um, uh, had some comments from people about the recertification of the Marshfield Dam um, that we might be looking into uh, being a, a party to the Certificate of Public Good for that um, because Montpelier has, is potentially affected, you know, as to the, the health of that dam. So um, just a heads up about that. Um, third thing, um, one of the things that uh, uh, came up in our discussions with the um, uh, new hotel proposal was um, the the Capitol Plaza um, Pacheras, etc. Um, wanted us to check in with you all about the possibility of um, a, doing some kind of a deal on water rates, and so I just want to ask: um, Is there any interest on giving them a water rates deal? And you can tell me now, or you can tell me later, <laughs> or not. <laughs> I, I know what Ashley's response is. No, is anybody? Is, how about this? Is anybody interested in talking about water rates? I think that would be really not. Okay, good. I'm just doing my due diligence. Yes, we've she just honored a commitment. I yeah. just, I had to. Yeah, I mean, if you thank and you. Bill okay. have a different we, perspective. Our answer was we don't it. think so, but we'll ask. But we'll ask. That's what we, that's what we said. So <laughs> I'm asking. So we, she okay. kept her word. Okay, that's that's it. That's all I needed to to do. Thank you. Um, okay, great. Um, and so that's, that's another thing. So now there's a, a couple other things that I want to, I'm, I'm really excited about that I want to, um, talk about super briefly. Um, I, I think I've sent you all a copy of the potential language for a charter change. Um, so I'm very interested in your feedback on that. I mean, we have, um, some opportunity to, uh, talk about that more formally. Uh, I, I don't see it on the September. Tw oh wait, when no, it's on it? the September twelfth. Right. So yes. next next time. Next time. Um, if so, I I have some ideas of um, ordinances that I would like to have conversations about. Um, Charter change or ordinance? I'm sorry. Um, there's some ordinance. There's some ordinances that um, I think. If the charter change were successful, then right. Yes, then we should that have this language. might allow. Now, one, just to put it very briefly, my interpretation of the the, the proposed charter change language is that it's just um, an exploration of the what it means for a public welfare. Um, so I just want you to know that there are three things that I'm thinking about for um, potential ordinances, and I want to invite you, uh, if you have ideas of what uh, ordinances might be um, enabled by that charter change language, um, I would love to get your, your feedback about that potentially before the 12th. Um, so that we can and just that. like us to be really aware of public meeting law, and maybe we should post what you shared in terms of the potential charter changes or something. I, oh. If we're all going to be providing you feedback, I just don't want to do that outside yeah, we'll, of a public we'll put it in the weekly venue. memo. Okay. Sure. That sounds great. Good. Thank you. Um, so first thing, I mean, is the, a plastic bag, either ban or tax. I mean, that's sort of what spawned this. Um, but I also want to explore the possibility of a citywide contract for compost. Um, and that could potentially go through the Central Vermont Solid Waste District. Um, with an agreement um, uh, with them, uh, so the, you know they would explore, uh, you know, putting out an RFP, etc. So if if you're interested in having more conversation about that, um, that's something that I would love to put on a upcoming agenda. Um, more specifically, is there interest in talking about that? Yes. Okay, it, I w I'm not interested in, uh, you know, taking up more staff time particularly, but I don't think this would take up that much. Or at least but, right now. Right. Well, anyway, yeah. But we can, <laughs> we can talk about that. So I'm seeing general interest in talking about citywide compost. Um, so that's another thing. And then um, there are some energy code um, ordinances that I'm, I'm really interested in. I'll, I'll tell you more about that later. So. Um, that is it for me. 
Thank you for bearing with me through all of those points. That's Thank why you, you ended the meeting at 1015. I understand. I'm sorry, Ann. I didn't get it. Did you send it with your city email or your personal email? Um, with the city email. And I think you even wrote back thanks. But I can send it to you again. Because I'm searching for it here. He said it was August 15th. If I'm, if I'm thinking of the right thing. It sounds about right. Should be about then. Let me. I can. I can tell you. Um, well, I've been I having forget. trouble, and Seth tried to work on it, but now he's jammed me out of Google Drive. So. Oh no. <laughs> All right, John. I think you're up. I uh, just say, thank you, Ashley, for the kind words about the election. However, long lines of the polling place are a sign, in fact, that that democracy is not working. <laughs> well, it was and unexpectedly so, long. And so does a desperate call for help there at the end of the day. Um, so all of which is to say, this is the second primary in a row where the crowds have been much bigger than expected. So I think for the first time maybe in our forever, um, Montpelier voters have discovered the primary. <laughs> and I think it's, it's here to stay, which means I think that's going to be the last time we follow the tradition and have it down here. Lost Nation isn't going to be happy, yeah, but, they can put you but in. I think that's the last el yeah. last election of any kind we're going to have in this room. <laughs> At least with the current administration issues. No, with, with the, and I think the machines forever. didn't work either. It's like we wow. had we had machines jam up, but there was there was a particular reason for that, and I know how to fix them next time. Yes, at one point, I, I called out that we were moving the hand count, which was something I never thought I'd hear myself say, but we got past it. <laughs> <laughs> Long time counting. And, and Donna, it is August 15th that I send it okay. to you. Okay. If you need yeah, it again, I'm signing then. it. But. I just have one minor thing. So I, um, I was going to pass, but Donna reminded me of something, which is some of you especially those who were on last year, remember that we had long, prolonged discussions with the state about Berlin Pond and um, whether we should sue them, and et cetera. And ultimately, we ended up agreeing um, that we were going to have this uh, containment area on the pond, and they were going to put rules in for that. And not too long ago, we got a letter from the state basically saying, you don't really need any rules. You can put, you know, floaters or whatever you want in the pond to, to mark the area. Well, that's great. It doesn't provide any enforcement. It doesn't, it's just, so what? What happens if someone violates it? So we are um, pushing back and saying, no, you know, we went through a process, we agreed, but we also may, you know, say, hey, listen, we're going to reconsider legal action. And I know there wasn't a lot of stomach for that, but we might have to have a stiff upper lip on this. They, you know, we, 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 caved a lot and got little and they're not even giving us the little so I think we need to to push uh, push on them and get I think I think ultimately we, we won't have to bring legal action they, they, but for some reason they just don't seem to want to promulgate these rules so anyway that's happening so that's it pass that's it I'm done after that <laughs> gotta get to Shaw's by 11 <laughs> All right, I think that is it. So move to adjourn without objection.